Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy's Tech Forum. I'm Ravi Agrawal, FP's Editor-in-Chief, and it is my pleasure to begin proceedings this Wednesday. Now, why are we here today? It's clear that technology envelops our lives in every way imag imaginable. Technology is the backbone of the global economy, of course, but in part because technological innovation has been so rapid in the last few decades, policy has struggled to keep up. And that's why FP is convening a global forum today centered around the, the trends, the risks, and the opportunities of technology. The reality is that every major policy issue, regulation, privacy, cybersecurity, AI, combating misinformation, and more, requires a multilateral approach to policymaking. That has so far been missing. So today we virtually gather government officials, academics, and industry experts to discuss different aspects of new and emerging tech and what efforts are underway to build a framework for tech policies that work for all. We have some terrific speakers joining us today, including Kirsty Kalulade, former president of Estonia. We also have a commissioner with the African Union, the deputy head of cyber at NATO, Chile's vice minister of trade, and many more important guests. That's all ahead. I wanna take a moment to thank our partners, Microsoft, the European Liberal Forum, and Northwestern University's Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Thank you to all of them. We couldn't do this without your support. Finally, before we get started, a few quick housekeeping items. We've got a great diverse audience from across the globe and we wanna hear from you. If you're logged in on our event webpage at foreignpolicy.com slash events, remember to submit your questions via the question box to the right of the video player on your screen. We'll try and include several of your questions during our live sessions, so get involved. If you're joining us on social media, chime in on the conversation using the hashtag FPTechForum. Okay, so let's get started. As I said, our first guest is Kirsty Kalulaid. She was the president of Estonia from 2016 until just recently. And under her tenure, Estonia became one of the most digitally advanced countries in the world. Just consider this before we bring her on. The country has just 1.3 million people, but it's given birth to several unicorns, Skype, TransferWise, Taxify, and more. 99% of Estonia's government services are online, including digital IDs and the opportunity to become an e-resident. You can even vote online. By some estimates, some of Estonia's online services save 2% of national GDP in bureaucratic time wasting, which is about as much as Estonia spends on defense commitments made to NATO. So what lessons can we learn from Estonia? And what can we learn in a way that would inform policymaking around the world? Please welcome Kirsty Kalulaid, President Kalulaid. Welcome. Great to have you with us. Good morning and happy to be here with you. So, um, I thought for starters, tell us a little bit about what makes Estonia special when it comes to harnessing uh, a vibrant technology sector. And I'm curious, um, during your presidential tenure, what was the impetus behind the government's uh, digital transformation? Well, I have to dig far more uh, into history to tell you where it all started. Uh, at that time, I was not the president of the country, but I was an advisor to prime minister. So I do remember how it all started. And um, we started because uh, our country need to develop public services from the scratch. We had no legacy systems in the 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed. And we did notice that private sector was quite a lot offering already, uh, well, work online, uh, internet, of course, was born already, and the banks were giving uh, out already services online for Estonian citizens. So, frankly speaking, we simply did not realize that the governments are supposed uh, not to be as up to date as far as technology goes. And we decided we will simply use the technology which was already available. So we were quick followers. We were not creators. And that's how it all started. And of course, at one point, uh, we experimented with a few services, and then we used banks' gateways, actually, to access these services, like tax board, for example. Nobody wants to see the taxman. That's what we knew already, but we wanted really to gather taxes quick and easy. So tax board went online, but the access was through online banking. And then the banks simply said that they're not going to support uh, and guarantee the safety of this connection for government services for long 
because they do not have the legal capability to uh, guarantee ID services. And together, the banks and the government then dreamed up uh, a digital ID. Again, a technology which already existed, but uh, Estonia was the one and only place where government started to use it. And what guaranteed the success was inclusivity. No Estonia has an ID card without digital ID. It doesn't exist. So even if initially people did not, of course, use everybody their digital uh, ID cards, everybody had one. And since services in a not so densely populated country are difficult to obtain offline, then with some training, some nudging, also voluntary help and support for particularly elderly, we managed to transform our society mm. online. And what is interesting in this is that if you look at the private sector digitalization to this day, you wouldn't call Estonia a leader globally, but what transforms a nation is government service offered online, because indeed our people find it perfectly normal that services are offered online and they are not anonymous, that they mm. have a quick, safe, easy and encrypted access to these services and nobody's looking on. This so is what Estonia has to expect. So let me pick up on your point about how, I mean, essentially government uh, transforms uh, the state of play in a country. And, you know, if you're another country with similar demographics and similar size uh, and you look to Estonia, um, what are the lessons that, you know, you would say there are to learn? Uh, and I put it this way because you've made it all sound very simple, uh, like fixing the digital divide or, or fixing a demographic issue. But, but how really do you go about those problems? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand that uh, people will not accept a uh, sudden change. It has to be gradually built in. It took us, well, the first service went online in 1997. And I would say up to 2005, many services actually ran parallel. But I mean, people, because they were also helped to understand how this government uh, online service offer works, and they were using in parallel through the same system, private sector services like online banking, which took up our digital ID because it was cheaper for them. It was also legally guaranteed. So people learned that there is one safe gateway. And it took us about 10 years to learn this. And it didn't, of course, happen just, I mean, people by here say uh, understood what they need to do. We ran training programs. We ran expensive training programs, supported both by private and the public sector. And if so, people ask why Estonia, I can tell you why. We do not separate our society in any way into private and public. Most of us have worked in private sector and public sector. Most of us expect the same level of technology from private and from public sector. We simply, well, are different in societal organization, not so much in technological organization of this country. So let me ask you this, I mean, because this is very interesting that, that you're saying there aren't that many differences societally between public and private. And, you know, I initially asked you what lessons a country that was similar in size and demographics could learn from Estonia. Let me tweak that question now. So could any of these lessons apply to a large country, you know, with different demographics? So let's say Nigeria, let's say India. Um, or would they say, you know, none of this could apply in our circumstances? It's just, you know, apples and oranges. Yes, it can apply, but you need political will and leadership because indeed, I mean, jobs in the public sector will be destroyed. They will be recreated somewhere else in the society, but initially there will be some jobs which will be destroyed. Even in Estonia, with pretty few legal systems, we lost 60% of our, of our jobs in, in tax board. But uh, this question has been asked from me before, and I've said, well, first, then liberalize your job market so that your job market, I mean, quickly and easily creates jobs and is not afraid to hire. Estonian job market is extremely liberal for an European country. And uh, I mean, you're not, uh, you're not uh, in any way gaining from staying in one job for a long time. And, and uh, well, firing people is easy, hiring people is easy. So Estonian labor market, is actually very flexible. And that's why we always have really low unemployment numbers. We actually are offering the residency and advocating for our companies to go and hire elsewhere because Estonian economy is far bigger than our labor force can mm. support. I give you just one example. Estonian uh, Unicorn 107 Volt hires 300,000 people globally. 
But Estonian own workforce is slightly above 700,000. So they're close to 45% of our own job market capacity outside Estonia. And that's how we have, I mean, we, we have seen all this transformation. It's inclusive, it creates rather than destroys jobs, and it definitely grows economy. Mm. And a lot of what you're describing would take immense political will in a large country. I mean, I'm thinking it about did. Did how, how well. difficult tax reform is in, say, the United States. Yes, but many a politician, I mean, lost elections and then came up, came uh, back four years later because people have meanwhile realized that realized that I mean the decisions taken had been right decisions for Estonia economy was growing. Estonia in 1990 was a poor country, and uh, an average salary was around thirty dollars. Now it is one thousand five hundred euros. So you see, I mean, the benefit has been immense, and the Estonian people have seen the benefits. And indeed, it took political courage. Uh, my boss, the prime minister, at the turn of the century, he never cared about, I mean, whether he is re-elected or not. We all know this saying, but we all know what needs to be done. We just don't know how to be re-elected. But uh, they didn't care. They cared about the future of the country. So um, let me push you now towards uh, technology policy. And, you know, everyone here in the United States uh, increasingly now is talking more about tech regulation, discussing different types of tech regulation. Uh, there are issues of taxation and antitrust and, and competition. Um, how do you think through these issues? What worked for Estonia? What lessons have you learned, you know, in your own time in government through thinking through these issues? And as it stands now, um, what is a good framework for other countries to, to discuss these things? Well, Many have thought that Estonia is some kind of a wild west for internet, but in fact it isn't. It is a tightly regulated, but it is a legally permissive uh, internet space. And that's the key to success. You have to regulate to give certain promises to your citizens, but you have to make sure that you do not stifle the growth while doing this uh, legislation and regulation. In Estonia, for example, it is very clear from the legal text that each and every citizen still owns the data which, uh, it ha which they have shared with the government. They have the right to know who has looked at their data. And this right is guaranteed by the fact that if there is some data is, uh, is acceded by somebody uh, in Estonia, there will be digital fingerprints. So we can verify who has been, like if I see somebody has looked my medical file, I can check whether it was my doctor. If it wasn't my doctor, I had the right to query and complain. So this is a legal space. If Let's take the European GDPR. When uh, this was approved, we didn't struggle too much to implement it because our own legislation actually is tight. And what was positive for Estonian private sector GDPR uh, applications was that since government, every time it thinks of uh, legislating a digital service, also feels it on its own skin. I mean, we're not legislating for this, I mean, alien thing called private sector digital services. We are legislating first and foremost also for ourselves. So we are in it together. And this probably helps us to develop a legally permissive space. Mm. And now about a year ago, Estonia took the next step. We created Accelerator Estonia, where Estonian government is buying in into the new AI related digital services related uh, technologies and services and not because it wants to make a good investment or, or, or not because it believes that, I mean, good ideas need government support. It buys in to make sure that it has skin in the game and will therefore get immediate feedback from technology providers and service developers in which way our legal system is hindering their development. And this hopefully helps us to always, well, stay a few turns ahead of, of the rest of the world in making sure that our legal space is permissive, but on the other hand, guarantees data safety mm. for citizens. This is how we have achieved it. It's a 20 years and more long process, but I'm sure it can be accelerated if you carefully study what we have done here in Estonia or for other countries. Mm. Um, I have many more of my own questions to ask you, um, but I'm going to bring in a couple of, of viewer questions um, because we have, uh, uh, I think, hundreds of viewers around the world right now listening live and many more will listen afterwards. But I just want to bring in some of their thoughts as well. So Azar Majdoub uh, in Barcelona, um, he's at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, um, has a question for you. He says, your country is simply inspiring taking into account how slow policy development and implementation is inside the EU, 
what are the circumstances and conditions that should come together for the rest of the EU member countries to follow your model? They are following, I have to say, but many citizens have not realized actually that they are. Many governments have built inside the government services a system which is digital, as is Estonians, but they still keep a desk officer, somebody sitting at a counter between the citizen and the uh, uh, digital ecosystem of the governance model. Uh, everybody actually has pledged to give a digital ID to their citizens. Uh, this is now decided since 2020 during German presidency, I believe this decision was taken. And even more, these digital IDs, they all have to be ADAS compatible, which means that they all have similar features in providing encryption, timestamping, signature, safety. So there is movement in European Union, and I believe Estonia has been catalyzing it because many European companies work also with Estonians and within Estonian ecosystem. Since you don't have to be an Estonian citizen to operate in this system, you can have an e-residency card and be part of this ecosystem. You can run your business from wherever you are in Europe or globally. And, and this has disseminated these ideas. So I believe that's why Europe actually is the only big rich economy where this kind of thinking has taken hold that the digital id is something which a government has to provide like it does provide you with analog mm. passport so you cannot say that europe is low europe is definitely ahead of let's say canada or us or australia or new zealand in this that we have a cross-border system well many citizens don't use it but i mean they have the opportunity to start using gradually as more services come online also what is maybe still not achieved is that in european union the private sectors in many countries do not rely on identification on the government provided digital id they really should because it is safe it is legally yeah. guaranteed and and this way we could actually close this digital divide between estonia and other european countries quicker um, so let's talk a little bit more about privacy uh, and data protection. Um, how do you think through balancing those rights um, with the way in which companies, you know, necessarily want and need to try to leverage uh, big data? And I think, you know, again, your example is interesting here because, um, uh, you know, Estonia clearly prioritized privacy, but it also um, allowed tech unicorns to be born and then to flourish. These tech unicorns we have, we have grown here do not rely, by the way, on government ecosystem. They are able to uh, sometimes offer services, for example, where if is offering, uh, is offering uh, the face recognition service for Estonian e-notary system. But, uh, but what uh, the government does allow here indeed is, is the uh, depersonalized use of, of the data which we have in our databases, particularly, for example, in Estonian Genome Foundation database. And also we are, we are cooperating with, uh, with Speak Pharma on, on some e-health data which we have. Some of it is even used in a personalized format, but then that concerns definitely a kind of data for medicines. Uh, like, for example, there are some expensive medicines against lung cancer, then you can uh, well tell, tell patients that they will get this medicine cheaply and, uh, and that uh, the, in exchange, I mean, they will provide information to the company. So there are various ways in which you can uh, use the data. And if the public trust wants ease with the government and the data, then the government only has to keep its promises. No data is used without the knowledge of a citizen. The data still belongs to a citizen. And the government guarantees that if somebody has been looking at the data, the citizen knows. And frankly speaking, I'm really, astonished how people do not see very often that this is far safer than their paper files in the government offices. Because we get always this question, how do you know it is safe? Well, I know it is in a digital file and I know who read it. I mean, you have a, probably a driver's license, for example, and it's accompanied by a medical uh, certificate. Do you really know who in the office which has provided you with the license really read your file last? You don't because it's on paper and you'd need a lot of forensic evidence and cost to know who read it in a digital format. I mean, it's, it's free. I mean, it doesn't cost anything for me to verify and nothing for government to tell me, I mean, who has been looking at the file. So indeed you cannot ever deem that digital is 200% safe, but you can actually demonstrate very easily that it's far, far safer than paper files. 
Um, we have a question from V. E. Tar um, in New York. Um, he works for uh, AARP. Um, and his question is, with the move to online banking in Estonia, how did you protect older people um, from financial abuse and scams? And I guess this goes hand in hand with issues of digital literacy. It goes hand in hand with people who are newly coming online and you know, may not be digital natives, uh, the way in which young people can be. So how did you think through and tackle those issues? Well, first and foremost, people uh, accede the bank ecosystem, internet, uh, the bank internet ecosystem with their digital ID. So the channel which they are creating between themselves and the internet bank is encrypted. Nobody can see they are in what they're doing there. And since the ecosystem offers various services, so you kind of enter the ecosystem without telling the system which service you're going to use. So it, it adds another complicating layer for those who might want to sneak in. But this doesn't happen. And then, of course, I mean, if you and your bank have a secure encrypted channel, then nobody can steal the data from this secure encrypted channel. This is how it works in Estonian ecosystem. Estonian banks do not provide any less safe accession methods anymore to internet banks. Yet, indeed, we have constant tries where people send, I mean, emails looking like a bank email or call people telling they are from the bank. And we are regularly informing our citizens that, I mean, no bank does this. So you, you know that if somebody is calling you or sending you an email asking you to provide your security codes for digital ID, you know it is a scam. It is 100% scam. It has never been anything but the scam. And no bank would do anything like this. No government service will do anything like this. So by definition, you cannot be hooked because banks do not send you emails requesting you to uh, identify yourself. It's only you who exceed the system, sign in, and then have access to your bank data. Actually, it's very simple, therefore, straightforward. Well, now for elderly people, you know, banks in Estonia, uh, in the beginning of the century, offered their online services free for retired people. Because, I mean, it was more cost effective for the banks, and the banks wanted to train elderly people to be online. And this helped a lot because, uh, as I told, Estonia has not long been a rich country and our uh, pensions are still very low due to the lack of uh, accumulated assets from the Soviet Union time of the elder generation. So if they could save a penny, they did. And of course, there was a huge voluntary help from, uh, from a younger generation to get uh, retired people online. How did it go? Well, nobody mm. had computers home. Let's, let's remember, computers were in village library or school or somewhere. So we said everybody has a free access to internet in these internet points. And let's say an old woman wanted to well, take a bus to go to the town to go to social office. And, and she waits in this uh, bus stop. Out comes from the village library, somebody, a younger person says, grandmother, where are you going? Well, I'm going to social office. Well, come in, I will tell you, you don't need to go there. I will show you how we can work from here. And you don't even have to take the bus. We will resolve your problem before the bus comes. If we didn't resolve it, you take the bus. And this is how we coached and trained and, and worked with our elder generation. It doesn't happen all by itself. This indeed has to be said. But it yeah. was a private, public, concerted effort. Uh, you know, so Mike Nelson uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, says that in early September, you gave a great speech on the Tallinn consensus. And he says his favorite sentence was, we should not use, stop using uh, technology uh, because we are afraid to use technology. Um, uh, so he, his question is, how can we fight tech clash, uh, especially in Brussels? Um, and as you're mulling that also, uh, Sanidhya Sandhir in India um, asks, um, what is the ideal modus operandi for governance to keep up with emerging technologies? How should different govern government organizations be involved? 
Well, I really think we should be globally connected and legally protected, and we should make sure that we do not stifle the growth of the uh, global uh, uh, digital services by over-regulating it. But one criterion to achieve this truly is that each and everybody, every government must live up to their obligation to provide passports for I mean, no government can shy away from this obligation. If people act and transact online, maybe to 30%, 50%, even more of their transactions happen online, then every government has to recognize its obligation. It's like on the street space. I mean, it's not totally safe. I mean, still nasty things can happen on the street space. But we have driven anonymity out of the street space. We do not, I mean, sell people things or, or, or allow them to make important, uh, let's say, real estate investments or investments anywhere without proving that they are who they claim they are or sell any assets and so on, so on. For some reason, governments have failed to recognize the same obligation nowadays in the digital world globally. But in fact, they should. And then we should indeed, we have started in Europe to build through ADA systems, such a global recognition system. But I think the whole world can easily follow because we are now actually developing one global recognition system which concerns our COVID passports. It would not be too big technological step to advance this to mutual or general recognition of digital IDs globally. And this is where we should be going. We should become globally connected, but we need to remain legally protected. And, and this is something which uh, I believe uh, all politicians simply have to recognize as their obligation. The world has moved into the digital sphere. There is no going back on that. Mm. COVID has demonstrated that, that uh, at least half of the jobs probably can be done online. And the global services market can only be kept globally open if there is no anonymity. We have taken things for ourselves and for our companies into our own hands. So you can be Indian or from Pakistan or from Vanuatu. If you have a stone and e-residency card, you can work in a stone and ecosystem freely. You can establish companies, you can work in any company, you can exceed the data according to your job description. This is possible, but I think this needs to develop into a global model. Indeed. Uh, I think I've been having an audio issue for the last few seconds, but I hear you now. So, um, you know, um, uh, there, there are a lot of other questions that are coming in from our audience, and I'll throw one last one at them. Uh, some of them are actually exactly what I was going to ask you anyway. Ruta Aidis from ACG Inc. Um, wanted to ask about um, hacking and, and just specifically if you um, are able to sort of talk through some of some of the policies that Estonia put in place or thought through in terms of keeping malicious actors at bay, um, you know, to deter hackers, to deter other countries and mal actors um, from being able to exploit vulnerabilities. Uh, what kinds of infrastructure were you able to put in place um, and what lessons again are there for other countries to learn? Well, there are always two sides. Tech side actually it doesn't differ. Whether you're protecting a government ecosystem or a bank ecosystem, it doesn't matter. I mean, technologically, all we do is exactly the same. We have some additional features which we need to protect, which is our digital ID system. There we have set the common standard that if there is a risk that this technology which we are using, uh, well, has some security risks and the uh, price of breaking into one digital ID falls below $50,000, we need to act. We need to revamp, we need to patch, we need to do something uh, different. This has happened once in 20 years time. But since we do not rely only on our digital ID cards, we also have smart ID, we have mobile IDs, all these things. We do not have, uh, have, uh, have problems to switch from one to another. The other part is legal. And here actually Estonia, while in United Nations Security Council, we have been dragging this debate uh, onto, onto the multilateral level. Security Council has had a debate and has discussed also a cyber attack, a malign attack against Georgia once. And this has started to create the case law that governments can seek protection also from multilateral system uh, for their uh, sovereignty 
uh, in digital sphere. This is important, I believe. So that a tech side where you are exactly like a bank and the legal side where you as a government have inherently better opportunities to protect your system than any private company does. President Kalilite, we're out of time now, but I, I can't thank you enough um, for joining us today, um, giving us your time and your advice and also talking us through Estonia's experience and what the world can learn from it. Thank you. And you know, you always need to think ahead. We are already thinking here of quantum computing and the post-quantum IDs, because when the quantum computing uh, happens once, then all our digital IDs will be crackable in a second. So we know that we need to be prepared for that time. And we're already thinking ahead. So if you are technologically advanced, you have to keep all the time investing into the new thinking. Otherwise, you're offline quicker than you realize. So thank you for taking interest. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And I couldn't agree more. I think the challenge for all of us today is to think through policy frameworks for how um, tech policy can keep up with the rate of change uh, of technology around the world and to do so in a way that builds frameworks um, for the whole world. Uh, thank you once again, President Kalilet. Thank you. Bye. Lots more up ahead, um, but up next, uh, a closer look at what is being done multilaterally. What efforts need to be made across sectors to promote more collaboration in the way technology is created and implemented? And how do we ensure that it's done so in a way that addresses concerns around global security, individual rights, and sustainable and equitable development? Let's welcome our panel. John Frank is Vice President, UN Affairs at Microsoft, Robin Geis is Director, United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, and Preeti Sinha is Executive Secretary at the UN Capital Development Fund. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, so Robin, great to have you all on. Robin, let's start with you. Um, uh, I think it might be helpful if you could begin by just talking us through the state of play uh, surrounding current emerging tech regulations around the world. And I'm especially interested in beginning with the shortcomings um, of existing governance frameworks uh, to grapple with security challenges uh, <clears throat> coming from cyberspace. So let's let's talk through the shortcomings first, and then I'll, I'll steer us through towards uh, policy solutions. Robin. Ravi, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today. I was actually going to start with some successes this year because <laughs> we have so much doom and gloom already. And uh, I'll come to the shortcomings in a moment, but just you know, wanted to remind us in a, in a deteriorating global security environment, earlier this year, we had two intergovernmental processes at the United Nations uh, that came to consensus reports. Uh, and that very nicely set the scene, I think, for a new intergovernmental process the open-ended working group that will take up its work next year and will continue to work for the coming five years. So actually that's a pretty pretty good scene setter. Uh, but yeah, there are you know, many challenges uh, abound. We need to do more uh, and certainly we need to do it together. Um, you know, maybe I take it from a bird's eye perspective really in terms of the challenges. I think cyberspace in particular has opened up uh, a whole new range of power projections that tend to the manipulative and whether it's manipulation in the social sphere, public opinion manipulation, or in the technical sphere when it's targeting infrastructure and critical infrastructure. The challenge there really is that many of our governance frameworks, legal frameworks of the 20th century, they were tailored towards the coercive, dealing with coercive activity. And this is why much of this manipulative activity is at risk at, at falling through the cracks really. And then another grand challenge that I see is that many you know, of the binary codes that we have developed to, to facilitate governance, uh, distinctions between military and civilian, distinctions between hard and soft power, external, internal, and peace and war at the end of the day, that these, uh, you know, distinctions, binary codes, they're increasingly eroding, uh, the lines are increasingly blurred, we're dealing with multi-purpose dual use technologies, and so obviously we have to uh, step up the act to be dealing with these uh, acts. So I think these are these are two of the principal shortcomings, very much at a meta level, but I do think they determine much of what we're uh, discussing at this panel and in relation to malicious cyber activity in, uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. Just lastly, let me say, uh, you know, we, I think we're all aware we need more multi-stakeholder engagement here. Uh, no single actor or, or group of actors is going to solve uh, these, uh, the magnitude of the challenges by themselves. Um, but 
and we've been saying that for quite a while. I mean, multi-stakeholder slogans are <laughs> all over the place. We need to get better about multi-stakeholder uh, integration, more systematic, uh, and we need more meaningful multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, these, I think, are uh, two of the issues clearly ahead of us and that require urgent attention. Those are good points to make, uh, Robin. Of course, the question is, uh, how do we uh, actually achieve multi-stakeholder engagement? We'll get to that. Um, John, let me bring you in. And um, I thought it might be helpful if, if you could chart out a little bit, you know, given your work, how a global commitment to sort of multilateral public-private cooperation uh, on the tech frontier would advance digital access and equity. Talk us a little bit of, uh, through the, the benefits of, of such an approach, uh, why it's needed and how to make it happen. Um, thank you, um, and it's great to be with you today. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, especially in the technology space, uh, the internet is owned and operated almost entirely by the private sector. The technologies being used by citizens and governments are private sector technologies. And, um, but, you know, we, so we, we believe that the private sector has an incredibly important role to play in these discussions about cybersecurity. Um, a, uh, a very important effort, I'd say, is you know, the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, which was launched at the inaugural Paris Peace Forum uh, four years ago. Just last week, the United States and the European Union officially became signatories to that as well. Um, but it's, uh, I believe, 76, 77 governments have now signed, as well as 300 corporations and several hundred civil society uh, groups and organizations, uh, public uh, organizations. So it's an interesting opportunity because it sets out nine principles that we agree to endorse, but also help work on the implementation because it's important to get to norms, but the underlying infrastructure of how does one implement norms of nation state behavior and private sector behavior. Uh, and so through the working group set up um, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France, um, and the multi-stakeholder group, uh, the goal is to, to take these ideas and to elaborate them. Uh, one example um, you know, is capacity building. You know, we need to have governments and private sector organizations know more about how to keep their system secure. Um, and there's a practical side. There's also just a, a, another side, which is a, a process sponsored by the Japanese government and Microsoft, uh, we call the Oxford process, which is a group of international law experts that that work on relatively short papers that that try to elaborate some of these principles. For example, uh, is ransomware a violation of international law? Uh, and so, giving an analysis and and sort of fleshing things out because we need to build out the system uh, of understanding what nation state responsibilities are, uh, as well as what activities. Um, they should not be undertaking. So I think that there is a great deal of effort. It's hard though. Um, ministries of foreign affairs are not the most, um, you know, they're not, they're used to government to government. Um, and they're typically, you know, it was, it's all foreign engagements. And so working with private sector organizations around the world and civil society groups, we all have to build that muscle. Um, and going to Robin's point about the open end working group and the next version, an open question is, how open will it be for non-state participants? And I think it's critically important that we get our perspectives, um, not just Microsoft, but um, you know, other technology companies and, and uh, customers. Um, you know, governments call them citizens, we call them customers, but, but that voice is incredibly important to have at the table. Indeed it is. I just want to remind all of our viewers from around the world that you can uh, jump in and ask some questions too. Again, many of our viewers are uh, experts in this space themselves, so I'm very happy to bring them in and hear from them. Um, Preeti, let me bring you in for now, and I'm curious, what cooperative norms and measures do you think are needed to address um, sort of the international security dimensions of, of tech innovations? So thanks, Ravi, and first a quick uh, thanks to Foreign Policy for having uh, UN Capital Development Fund here. And just to add to what Robin and John were saying, uh, let me bring the perspective of the developing markets here, the emerging markets, because that's where we work. So UNCDF uh, serves the 46 of the least developed countries. 
And now on the good side that mobile penetration, internet, ICT is reaching these customers, uh, clients, citizens, but also the fact that 30% of population might still not have a mobile or access to um, tech by uh, 2025. So in these uh, countries, what we do, we work on a market systems development approach. What, we, what that means is we start with the policy uh, makers, with the regulators. We work a lot on financial inclusion. So basically, we're trying to run, uh, get businesses running uh, in these economies. As you know, everybody hit really bad with COVID, livelihoods impacted. So under sort of the goals of SDG 8 and SDG 9, which is jobs and innovation, for example, we worked with Central Bank of Mauritania to set up uh, how e-payments would work in, in the central bank in, in Mauritania, right? Think of that country there. And uh, then to provide the customers with a safe um, regulated uh, system where they can be protected and they can also have recourse. So listening to uh, panelists here, let me bring in this perspective of those countries and uh, important to grow businesses there, important to give them digital access, but also to then have them as equal players in this digital, global digital tech economy. So we, we work in those countries and I've got some other examples from Uganda, from Bangladesh, but really we work on another just to highlight something called Better Than Cash Alliance, where we are encouraging digital payments, which are more secure, more regular. So in Bangladesh, for example, uh, we help the garment uh, factory women, um, you know, get access to payments, but also safeguard those payments, safeguard their data. So let me also bring in the data elements, of course, and uh, also to um, have recourse. So Ravi, lots of examples, but perhaps in this dimension and bringing this element of those emerging markets into the conversation. Mm. And Preeti, you know, I just want to stay with you for a second here because, uh, you know, your perspective is actually so so vital here because, you know, for example, when we were chatting with um, the former president of Estonia earlier, you know, it's one thing to look at how, uh, you know, mostly rich or developed Western countries can, uh, for example, train segments of their population or the way in which they can frame how to think about policy uh, um, uh, or cybersecurity uh, or online participation. But, you know, in, in, in countries in the developing world, it's, a, it's harder to, to imagine how all of that works, uh, especially given digital literacy, even basic literacy, literacy, I should say. I mean, hundreds of millions of people around the world are still illiterate. Um, I, you know, how do you think through all of those issues? And when you listen to stories such as those of Estonia, do you think, do you think there's a model there that actually can be followed or, or does it sound more like a pipe dream? No, definitely can be followed. And let me bring to you the enthusiasm, the energy, the aspirations in these countries that we serve as well. But the fact that technology itself is neutral, right? Technology is, you can't call it inclusive or non-inclusive. It's how you implement it. So the digital divide, of course, is a, is a cause of concern for us. For example, one statistics is that even in where ICT, mobiles, everything is available, the uptake by women is 23% less than that of men. So, you know, even when things exist, uh, there is um, sort of a drawback in the, um, the technology acceptance. But um, it's definitely taking Estonia as an example. And I sorry, didn't hear all of her remarks, but uh, certainly a leading example. So we hope that countries like Uganda, uh, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, like many more that we serve, we basically serve about 33 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, a couple of them in Asia. So we uh, try to work on the supply of services. So there should be the supply of digital services, but also the demand. That demand then addresses the financial literacy, the skills training, all of that that needs to happen together. So uh, let me give you one quick example. In Uganda, for example, we wanted this coffee exporter to have digital payments for his 6,000 farmers and MTN, the um, kind of the, the mobile provider, wouldn't put in a tower there because he didn't, he, they didn't think it was commercially viable. So we gave them a guarantee of just 100,000K to put up a tower. And he found that uh, basically he broke even in six months and the uptake by the farmers was 25% higher than the national average. And in about three years, everybody was uh, receiving digital payments. So, you know, there is a lot of aspiration, willingness. I think we need to take that investment into the story. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The aspirations in the developing world are, uh, they need to be seen to be, uh, to be believed. Um, Robin, let me bring you back in. Um, I'm wondering if I can push you towards specifics, you know, in terms of what policies um, would you say are needed uh, on an international scale 
uh, to ensure the safe and equitable development and use of technology? How do you think through all of that? So, you know, a, a broad question, but uh, I, I would say, uh, first of all, the, the, the challenge ahead of us is really implementation and operationalization of, of norms and really drilling it down and ironing out more of the details. Uh, the General Assembly earlier this year confirmed the application of, of the UN Charter of international law in, in cyberspace. Uh, so that's a solid basis to, to start from. And over time, you know, we can always hope for more, but we have developed some norms and principles of behavior that are out there already. Just, uh, you know, think of uh, the principle that uh, states should seek to prevent the proliferation of malicious um, software tools and techniques. Uh, that's an important one. And now is the time to really uh, drill it down, uh, look more into the details and take it to a more granular uh, level. And to me, the only way that can happen, and this is, you know, picking up on, on John's point about uh, meaningful multi-stakeholder um, uh, engagement, the only way it can happen in really being more systematic about bringing those in that are at the front lines, uh, and this is mostly the private sector, this is, of course, also civil society, academia, uh, and the science sector, but the private sector in particular running the infrastructure, they are the first ones to see uh, you know, new attack surfaces emerging, new attack vectors. And throughout the pandemic, we've, we've seen how, how dynamic this whole environment of malicious cyber operations mm. can be. Um, so bringing them in and not just inviting them to panels, you know, I mean, bringing them in in a meaningful and systematic way so that we can leverage their expertise, practical experience in the use of these technologies. I think that will be key uh, in driving the implementation forward. Also, I would say, you know, we're seeing quite an inflation of processes. And I don't mean it in a negative sense, but there is a lot happening around cyber, of course, these days in all corners of the world. And that's great. And I think that only responds to the magnitude of the challenge we're facing, digital transformation across all aspects of, of life, really. Um, but we also need to make sure that we maintain some sort of coherence. And I think this is where the United Nations can come in um, as a bridge builder between the different actors, ensuring inclusivity among all states, certainly. And we heard from Preeti, uh, not all states, you know, have same interests and challenges and issues in this domain. Um, but also in keeping the different processes together, making sure that principles uh, can be universalized over time, making sure that we share information, and above all, and this goes back to John as well, that we engage in capacity building. I think a stronger, uh, you know, commitment also to capacity building in this field uh, and enhancing digital equity, digital literacy will help us to solve a whole range of challenges, not just speedy recovery from the pandemic, uh, but also, you know, a global security in the digital field uh, by and large. I hear you on the capacity building. Let me bring in one of our viewer questions. Um, uh, this is from Sarah Spencer in Amman, Jordan. She's at the British Diplomatic Service. Um, and as I bring in the question, I just want to remind uh, our other viewers, you can you can jump into the conversation. Uh, you just need to use the Q&A box um, on the events page, foreignpolicy.com backslash events. But John, this question is for you from Sarah Spencer. Um, and she asks, um, in your opinion, what will foreign policy look like? five years from now, will private tech companies increasingly have corporate foreign policies? Will they have embassies around the world? What changes to the current architecture would improve regulation such that it safeguards the rights of citizens and customers? Uh, so John, that question is to you. We're gonna uh, obviously address some of these questions um, in a panel coming up later, that's diplomacy in the digital age. But John, over to you. It's a great question. And as a uh, tech diplomat, we have a representation office uh, here uh, very close to the UN. Look out my window at the UN building. Um, and, uh, you know, we are engaged around the world with international organizations as well as national governments. We're, we're not a government. We're quite different. Um, you know, governments have, talk about their values and interests. Well, we want to have the same values wherever we do business. And so a commitment to democracy, uh, privacy, respect for individuals. Um, we think that's incredibly important everywhere we go. Um, and our, our interests are really our customers' interests. How do we have customers succeed in today's digitizing world? Um, we're in this decade, 
technology is going to go from 5% of the economy to 10% of the economy globally. Uh, and it's infused in every aspect, whether it's agriculture, we heard about pretty mentioned the payments um, uh, for farmers in rural areas uh, to um, the advances in data science that will be transforming really every aspect of our lives. Um, and so uh, it is important to be able to, to, to operate in a global world. There's values to us all being connected. Um, but you know, our social values need to be reflected in the technology. And society needs to hold technology companies accountable, not just for the promise of their products, but how they're actually used in practice. Um, because, you know, in technology, we love to think we're going to change the world and with positive things, but, but we have to be accountable for how our product, products are actually used uh, in the real world and, and own up to um, the negative consequences and address them. So I think that, you know, technology companies do play an incredibly important um, role in the world. And we need to take responsibility for that role. Um, so I do think you're going to have more um, corporate engagement. And I do think that um, in this changing, increasingly globalized world, um, you know, I think that's a good thing. We're not governments. We don't pretend to be. And, and but we do have something to add to the process. And, and if we can help create solutions, um, that's great. But also we need to do it in a way that's transparent um, and that people can, you know, give us feedback. So, um, you know, it's a delicate role, but I think it's an important one. I think so too. And I think your words will resonate with uh, a lot of people um, who get to listen to this. John, um, stay with me. What what are some examples of successful approaches to tech governance? Like, what, what lessons do you see emerging uh, when you look around the world? Um, a great example uh, of a multi-stakeholder engagement is um, the Christchurch call, you know, following the terrible uh, violence uh, at the mosques in Christchurch. Um, this is in New Zealand. Uh, yes, and, ago, yeah. right. Prime Minister Dern um, sort of convened some tech people and said, we need to we need to work. We need to do better. And so, you know, we created a framework where it's companies and governments um, putting together a system so that when these kind of events happen, um, we can prevent the, the wide broadcast um, of the violence and thus reduce the, the incentive for people to want to go do these things. Uh, and it's, you know, it's been a little uncomfortable for governments to say they're going to sit on an advisory group of a private sector led organization. Meanwhile, it's a little, you know, for us, it's sort of like, well, if we're going to ask them their advice, we have to take it. Um, and, and so it's, it's a mixed bag, but you know what? Operationally, it works together and it's a narrow specific problem, but it's a good example of by working together, be willing to sort of rethink the boundaries of our roles. Um, we can work together to address things. So that, that's that's one specific example. Mm. I'm just going to bring in uh, a couple of viewer questions uh, and and throw them to our panel. Uh, John at the Rhodium Group in DC, um, his question is, other than the UN, what are key organizations that are helping pioneer global norms on tech innovation? Are such organizations best pioneered at more local or regional levels first and then universalized? So hold on to that question. And also Julian Ringoff um, in Berlin at the uh, European Council on Foreign Relations asks, what role do you think plurilateral initiatives such as the Trade and Technology Council can or must play to secure democratic regulation of the digital sphere, considering that global agreements on many of these issues are unlikely in view of an increasingly multipolar world? Um, excellent questions from Julian Ringoff uh, and John at the uh, Rhodium Group. Um, Robin, I saw you nodding vigorously on the first question, so let me throw that one to you, um, or if you'd like to sort of uh, uh, double up answers to both, but over to you. No, no, definitely. But, uh, you know, I was uh, also uh, nodding vigorously on, on the hopeful message on which John ended that we, we can work successfully, especially given that you pushed me into shortcomings uh, at the opening question. And, and just to add to that, if I may, you know, CERN here in, in Geneva, the International Space Station, we have good examples over a long period of time how in the field of scientific innovation uh, we have uh, good collaboration on an international 
level, definitely. Um, but uh, to uh, the question, you know, which entities other than the UN, uh, many other entities other than the UN are, of course, well positioned to contribute uh, to this. Uh, you know, this is going to be a, a mix of different things. Uh, we're dealing with such a, a broad and, uh, you know, defining challenge really here, digital transformation. I think we need bottom-up bottom -up approaches very much. We need regional approaches. And I think the specific role of the UN can then be to either act as a bridge builder, an accelerator of some of the bottom-up uh, approaches and it can give them a boost. Uh, and it can ensure coherence uh, by bringing them them all together. So in this sense, you know, it really needs a pluralist approach. There's a magnitude of challenges, they are complex and they are dynamic. Uh, and I think the response needs to be of the same nature. Th there needs to be a bit of expectation management maybe also, because sometimes I have a feeling that we're, there is this idea that there could be that panacea, that, that one treaty that solves all of our issues. And that just won't be the case. It will be a dynamic process uh, throughout. And right now, you know, we've been very much focusing on, on cyber issues, I would say. But artificial intelligence is just to, I mean, has already, of course, entered uh, the playing field, uh, but it will be implemented exponentially. It will bring about a whole set of new questions, challenges, opportunities, of course. Um, and so I think we're looking at a package of various uh, measures, some of them legally binding, others voluntary, bottom up and top down. And I think we just need to be mindful and 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 uh, you know uh, cautious that that we get it right uh, that uh, we're not seeing an inflation of different processes and that by the end of the day we'll bring it all together and we know towards which aim we're working uh, and for that reason i think it's so important that the un charter has already been confirmed uh, mm. to be applicable in cyberspace because it's the value basis from which we uh, start um Preeti, i'm going to come to you in a second john did you want to weigh in as well on these questions just quickly, I, I think there's a proliferation right now of government initiatives around the world. Um, and whether it's in Australia um, or India or um, the UK, there's, there's, you know, since the UK left the European Union, it's going to have its own regulatory framework. And, you know, the European Union brings together, um, you know, the 27 nations for a common framework. OECD will be an incredibly important place, I think, to at least try to bring some of these together. And I'd say that things like the tech count, the tech and trade uh, council is a great idea. Um, we need the ability to make tough decisions and trade offs. And, you know, experts can, can work on refining problems, but, you know, we do need political leadership as well to be able to, to make the deals that, that close, uh, close the gaps. Um, Preeti, what do you think is the role, um, first of all, your, your thoughts on, on the last couple of questions we just had, but also um, what do you think is the role of finance and you know, new novel financial instruments that can encourage tech development among the least uh, developed countries, uh, you know, the area that you uh, are an expert in? Thanks, Ravi. First, a shout out to the audience. These are the best audience questions I've ever seen. I know, they really are. <laughs> They're really good, very thoughtful. Well, thanks, foreign policy audience. Um, I wanted to say, um, in terms of partners, again, agreeing with my panelists, a bunch of uh, really great partners. I would say CGAP is one, we're strong on financial inclusion. Um, you know, we work with MetLife Foundation out in, uh, you know, on the Asian side, who, doing um, tech and the silver economy. So great a number of innovations. Singapore is a leader, um, building bridges in Geneva coming up, a great uh, forum there. But let me bring to you uh, an instrument we have. It's called the Inclusive Digital Economy Scorecard, IDIS. It reflects our one of our teams. It's called the Inclusive Digital Economies. And there we uh, ask um, governments to adopt it to, to measure how the marginalized people in their economies are getting access to data and information and ICT. And this kind of uh, trustworthy gathering of data helps governments create policy. So just to say that um, we use that in Solomon Islands and in um, Burkina Faso in these countries. So I want to sort of conclude by this great uh, quote, what gets measured gets managed or Reagan, Ronald Reagan's favorite quote, uh, I trust, but I verify. So I think the role of data there. And just on the finance side, I mean, that's our bread and butter. That's what we do. So we are investing in last mile connectivity along with ITU in Geneva, last mile connectivity, fintech innovation, those who provide uh, companies that provide digital access to SMEs. Our focus is on SMEs, SMEs that adopt digital uh, so payment systems, et cetera. I don't know if you have a moment, Ravi. Do we have time? I might give you a great example. 
Go for it. I'd love a great example. So in Uganda, there's a motorcycle uh, delivery, motorcycle taxi company called Safe Boda. It used to transport people around, especially SME type of, you know, uh, clients. And in COVID, it got shut down because nobody was moving. So we helped them develop an e-commerce platform that uh, made them a grocery delivery service. So in COVID, they went around and delivered groceries. So that saved, um, you know, jobs of 18,000 of the Safe Boda people and got access to food for 50,000 people. So that's uh, where the investments come in. That's how, and that's the Uber for Uganda. That's really great to hear. I have to say, Preeti, you're such a great antidote to a, a journalist like me uh, in, in that you're, 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 you're bringing in some of the happier uh, stories. Um, last thoughts, um, uh, because I do need to wrap. Uh, John, I'm going to come to you. Just um, take us through to the end in terms of, you know, looking ahead to the next year and beyond. You know, what is your sense of the key uh, areas of focus and cooperation and the way in which the world needs to think about um, frameworks for, for tech policy coordination and cooperation. I believe the this past year, the, ex- the experience of the last 20 months with, with, with the pandemic has demonstrated to us how essential connectivity is and the digital divide has never been starker. So I think we will see important efforts to address that. And uh, you know, Pretty's work on the 46 least developed countries is incredibly important. We're leading the the, biz, the private sector forum at the least developed countries uh, conference in Doha in January and bringing in private sector organizations to talk about the private sector working with governments and, and agencies can can do more to increase the economic development and close the digital divide. Um, I do think also the sense of cybersecurity is incredibly important to us. And so I think that we're gonna see more discussion and progress and more action. Um, you know, the Biden administration has taken a more aggressive approach having the NSA disrupt ransomware. Uh, and that's that's a, a, a small example, but it's a significant step of the change dynamic. So I think that um, we will see cybersecurity, but also addressing the digital divide will be essential. Those are great thoughts to end on. John Frank, Vice President of UN Affairs at Microsoft. Robin Geis, uh, he's a director at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. And of course, Preeti Sinha, Executive Secretary, UN Capital Development Fund. Thank you to the three of you um, for your insights and thoughts. Uh, I learned a lot from that right there. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Great to have you all on. Lots more up ahead. Again, if you're listening, if you're watching, you can take part. We've had some terrific questions uh, so far. So please keep them coming. Uh, You see the Q&A box uh, on your screen. If you're looking at this on uh, our events webpage, that's foreign policy backslash foreignpolicy.com backslash events. Uh, Otherwise, you can always email us at events at foreignpolicy.com. Lots more up ahead. And to take you through there, I'm pleased to now um, hand over to my colleague, Amy McKinnon. She's FP's national security and intelligence reporter. You should follow her work. Amy's going to take us through a conversation exploring how technology plays into the foreign policy consideration of the EU and how it's impacting transatlantic affairs and much else. Amy, take it away. Thank you, Ravi, and what a fantastic discussion that was. I really love that example at the end there, of really bringing these issues to life for us. I'm delighted to continue our event today with a discussion on the EU's calls for strategic autonomy, that is increasing the bloc's self-sufficiency and issues of defense and national security, and how that plays into the realm of technology policy. In terms of technology, this has been seen as reducing the dependence of the EU on the United States, but also crucially, uh, Uh, reducing the extent to which the bloc supply chains are reliant on technology and components from China. This debate has been only made more urgent by, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. So can the EU become a defense technology superpower and what needs to happen to make that possible? To discuss this issue, I'm joined by Francis G. Burwell, a distinguished fellow of the Atlantic Council and a senior director at McClarty Associates. Also joined by John Neufer, the president and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, and Dragos Sudaraki, a member of the European Parliament, deputy chair of the Renew of the Renew Europe, the Renew Europe Parliamentary Group, uh, and chair of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age. Uh, Dragos is joining us from another event, so he'll be he'll be coming in a few minutes late uh, to our event today. So. Welcome, everybody. We're delighted to have you joining us. 
Uh, just as we have a very global audience, like we do for all of our events dialing in today, I just want to kind of set some context on what we mean when we talk about uh, strategic autonomy in the realm of technology. And Francis, I'm hoping that you can, can kind of set, set the scene for us, give us a sense of the lay of the land. I mean, what do European leaders mean when they talk about strategic autonomy and technology? And, and where is the state of the debate on this issue right now? Well, I think what they really mean is the ability of the European Union and its member states to make its own decisions uh, and not be hindered by a lack of capabilities. So this debate really took off after the Libya operations uh, when they found themselves unable to provide some of the intelligence and uh, refueling capabilities that they needed in order to pursue that operation. And so within the defense and foreign policy realm within the EU, the notion of strategic autonomy took off as kind of the ability of the EU to be a stronger actor in the world and to back that up with serious capabilities. Um, what has happened since then is that this debate has migrated into the tech world. And the EU in, in the defense world has pursued certain uh, initiatives such as PESCO and also boosting the European Defense Agency and various projects. But in the tech world, there's a slightly different um, challenge because it's not governments that really develop commercial technologies, right? It's companies, governments can set the rules. But I think they were, uh, as, as technology became ever more part of our lives, I think a number of Europeans were kind of taken aback by how few European companies were really world leaders in that, on that stage. And I think for the Americans in your audience, if you think about this, uh, a world where we bought everything online from a Japanese company, we bought uh, our, our main platforms for listening to each other and engaging with each other on social media were French or German. And I mean, really, there were no American companies that were, you know, managing the internet and providing us with these services. I think we'd be taken aback. Um, and so the idea of sovereignty and strategic autonomy has migrated to the tech space. This has, as you pointed out, then been coupled with the impact of uh, supply chain disruptions and COVID, where it became very clear that there were strategic technologies that neither the EU nor the United States felt adequately prepared for. And I would just say that we are now going through the same discussion a little bit differently, but in terms of things like strategic minerals, things like semiconductors, uh, we are uh, medical supplies and vaccines. We're talking about how do we uh, how do we protect ourselves? How do we make sure that we have the capability to act? And so I think that's really where this debate goes, the, comes from. The question is, what's the role of government? Does it support research? Does it support uh, keeping supply chains open, such as what we've seen discussions about whether ports should run 24 hours a day or not? Who manufactures semiconductors? When is it government support and when does it become protectionist? And I think that is the crucial issue. And we don't we don't have good guidelines right now. And that's really where the U.S. and the EU need to work together to get some definitions of what's acceptable in uh, creating that autonomy or sovereignty and what is not acceptable. Thank you, Francis. And uh, welcome, Mr. Tudoraki. You uh, joined us um, at, at a really perfect moment. Um, Francis was, you know, was, was setting the scene for us about what we mean when we talk about strategic autonomy when it comes to technology. And one of the things she touched upon was, of course, you know, some of the very best technological innovation comes from the private sector. But with the European Union now looking to boost its strategic autonomy and technology, what do you see as, 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 you know, what can lawmakers do in Europe to kind of stimulate investment and growth in, um, in, in the private sector when it comes to technology? And what can be done to retain that, that, that talent and, and, and those companies within the European Union make sure that they, we don't have a brain drain or they don't get bought up by, by American companies, for example, or other international players? 
Well, um, first of all, thanks a lot for for inviting me, and and I've I've caught uh, I think a good part of, of Francis's intervention, and whom I say hi. Uh, we we just met two weeks ago in Washington, um, and I very much agree with 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 her intro um, on autonomy and what we both on uh, the EU side and on the US side of the Atlantic need to do. Um, what can regulators do, and what do regulators do here in Europe? Um, I think the the first fundamental step was to actually recognize the challenge, um, to recognize the the reality of this digital, this technological transformation, and in a way taking over a bit the the geopolitical agenda for for all of us, because that in itself I think was a good thing. I remember just a couple of years ago, if you come here in Parliament and and talk about artificial intelligence and and its role. Uh, for the future, you will have a lot of eyebrows uh, raised and nothing much. There were, there, were, there, were, there were very few of us legislators at European level uh, that were actually quite tuned into, uh, into this new reality. And right now, the situation is fundamentally different. Uh, the mere fact that we have a special committee like the one that I'm, that I'm leading on artificial intelligence is a testimony to that. So again, number one, political awareness and recognizing this as a priority. Then second, and that's something that this commission uh, since 2019 has done, and also this parliament, but also the level of national governments in Europe, is to uh, basically try and put, I say, I underline try, uh, try and put uh, our money where our mouth uh, was and is. Uh, in other sense, um, recognize that if you actually have that ambition, and if you want to stay tuned with this transformation and with this new digital revolution, um, and if you want to build that autonomy and build that, that ability to play on the international scene, then you have to invest. Um, and if you look at how the, uh, digital investments and, and the new, the creation of this new industrial base, uh, underlying this autonomy or this quest for sovereignty and autonomy, the, the, the way it's, it received, uh, a, a place in the structured MFF, the, the multi-annual budgetary framework for the EU, uh, it shows uh, more than it did in, in the past. And then also with the new instrument post-COVID for economic recovery, uh, there, there is this threshold of, of minimum 20% that have to be invested in, 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 uh, in frontier technologies. And I think that's, that's again, a very clear sign of, of how we regulators at European Union level understand to prepare for this. And there's also a very sizable effort that is being done nationally by various governments of, of member states who also put their own national money, good parts of their own budgets create national programs for it. Now the question is, is it enough? And are we leveraging enough the scale of the entire EU market uh, to actually create that, that stimulus effect and, and instill that creativity, that innovation spirit in the European companies in order for them to actually gear up for this reality? And that's actually a question where I think the jury is still out there because we haven't yet seen, from my point of view, at least in all of the areas where we want to, we haven't yet seen the effects of this new political priority that we've uh, recognized and, and the money that we've put on the table. Uh, a lot of this money is meant to go through very decentralized uh, um, instruments and, and the creation of all sorts of networks between uh, research institutes in Europe between industry and, and research um, all, in all sorts of consortia that are meant to form uh, a, a, a through and, and across borders, which is actually a good thing. Uh, but I think we also need to invest more in a, in a steer that is being given. Uh, and this is where uh, the, the industrial ecosystems, the way the commission has envisaged them play, play a role. Um, so, I'll just say that uh, I think now all the ingredients are in the pot uh, and the pot is on, on, on fire and it starts, uh, it starts brewing. Now, uh, whether at the end of the day we'll have uh, a recipe that actually uh, we all like uh, and it actually is serving the purpose that we wanted, uh, as I said, I think the jury is still uh, out there. Thank you for that uh, insightful answer. Um, I'm now want to bring in uh, John. Um, you know, the pandemic has taught even Luddites like me uh, an incredible amount about the importance of, uh, of semiconductors. Um, and looking at the supply chain of the materials 
needed for a technology like semiconductors? I mean, what did the pandemic teach us about the importance of su supply chain resilience? And what are the kind of short-term, but also long-term solutions to the global shortage, to the global chip shortage? Thanks, Amy, and, and, and great to be here. Uh, I think it certainly taught us, uh, this, that this pandemic taught us how dependent we are on tech products uh, uh, to, for our daily lives. And certainly, uh, chips are cent very central to all that. They power all the products that uh, help us work, study, stay healthy, and play remotely. Um, I think especially with the auto chip shortage, uh, people really woke up to how important uh, semiconductors are. As for solutions, well, in, in the immediate, uh, for, for the immediate problem, we in our industry um, have been doing everything humanly possible to get as many chips out of clean rooms to our customers. Um, we've been running above full utilization for the entire uh, pandemic, and it's it's uh, it's resulted in this year we will ship um, a trillion chips to our customers this year, uh, far surpassing previous records. But for the longer term, and probably more interesting for this for this group, for us we need more fabs. Uh, you know, fabs only have four walls. We're running at four capacity. It takes two or three years to build a fab, and we need to get those cycled up. Uh, but we also need to diversify our our risk, and we all need to be thinking about that. Whether you're in Europe or whether it, whether you're in the United States, in 1990, uh, the U.S. manufactured 37 percent of the world's chips. That figure is down to 12 percent today. 75 percent of all chips are now manufactured in East Asia. And that's because other governments, particularly governments in East Asia, have been offering huge manufacturing incentives. The US government has not been in this game. So fortunately, the Biden administration and, and Congress are, are moving to level the playing field and moving to pass legislation, hopefully this year, that provides six significant man, man, manufacturing incentives that make the U.S. Uh, a bit more attractive to uh, chip manufacturing. Um, but I want to say that um, this effort is not an effort to create uh, self-sufficiency in the chip supply chains. Uh, that that that's, uh, would be highly in inefficient, would be prohibitively costly. Um, our industry uh, has de uh, depended heavily on global supply chains to, uh, to innovate and be strong. And we will continue to do so going, in the, going into the future. But we need to rebalance the supply chains. And I think the pandemic um, showed us that we have some vulnerabilities. One of them is we don't produce enough, enough chips here. And if we don't change how we do things in terms of our incentives, um, someday we won't, we won't produce any. And I just think that makes people, as Francis suggested, makes people here feel very, very uncomfortable, particularly since chips have such a important national security nexus. Um, so, so there's going to be a lot more fabs built uh, to address, to meet the demand uh, for chips and uh, which power AI, quantum computing, all, all the emerging 5G, 6G, all the emerging technologies. And um, we just want to make sure uh, that more of the fabs that are built around the world are built here. And I think Europe is probably thinking the, the same thing. Um, but again, we are talking about um, not a reshoring of technologies, but more onshoring of, of, of chip production. And um, it's so it's, it's we are not talking about um, uh, uh, self sufficiency, uh, trying to capture the, the, the whole uh, supply chain of chips. I want to remind our audience watching at home before we continue that you can submit your own questions for our distinguished guests today. Um, you can use the Q&A box on, on our event platform next to the screen where you're watching or on social media using the hashtag, hashtag FP Tech Forum. So staying with you for a moment, John, I mean, our discussion today is about European strategic autonomy, but I think there's no getting away from the fact that the US and the EU will need to work together on technology, particularly as they seek to work together to address um, you know, the increasing competitive challenge from China. But what steps can EU and, and US policymakers take together to ensure our collective semiconductor supply chain resilience? Yeah, there's, I think, a lot of pieces in the answer there. Um, 
I'll say as we think about uh, challenges uh, uh, from China and other places, we need to work together uh, to ensure that our, kind of our global trading system uh, is 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 functioning well. We need to we need to work together on difficult issues like state subsidies and state-owned enterprises. These can be very distorting and le and and uh, lead to major non non-market driven um, overcapacity problems. But but um, you know I, I think I think both our economies need to need to double down and focus on manufacturing incentives to 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 make us make us more attractive to manufacturing here or in Europe. Uh, uh, design incentives. We we we're trying. We tried to get a an investment tax credit for for the design side of our industry, which which is huge. Uh, in in recent legislation, we were not successful, but it's something to think about for the future. And then we have a real problem with with uh, work workforce. Uh, not enough kids study about semiconductor uh, engineering, electrical engineering. In fact, uh, only one in four students emerging from our graduate programs are, are U.S. born programs that uh, uh, for electrical engineering or computer uh, 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 computer science. So so it's 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 great to have all the foreign talent in our universities, but it, it points to the fact that we are not we are not uh, generating enough uh, enough STEM kids and and our immigration system is such that the foreign talent that we train here ends up going back to where they where, 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 where they're from because they can't stay in the US because they can't can't get a visa. So I, I think there's 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 collaborative uh, work there as well. Uh, and then certainly there is room for collab more collaboration on on research. You know you can manufacture all the chips in the world, but if you're not if you're not folding in the research element, um, your your industry is diminished. And then finally, there's definitely more room for collaboration in trade policy. Uh, Eighty percent of our customers in the U.S. or overseas uh, are are tremendous amount components and chips move around the world and they need to go across borders at a zero in zero out uh, tariff treatment. And, you know, for example, uh, five years ago, we worked very closely with the EU and got the information technology agreement expanded in the WTO. And that reduced and elimin eliminated tariffs on a vast array of, of tech products so they can move around the world tariff free. And we really have to have a global trading system that's functioning well and, and that's being adhered to by all the major actors to ensure that we have uh, resilient supply chains, ones that we can de depend on and that can provide great efficiencies. Francis, I could see you nodding along there as John was talking. Um, I want to pick up on a point that you mentioned in your opening remarks about this distinction between protectionism and sovereignty. I mean, where do you see that that line is? and and Kind of, if you had to grade the European Union right now, how do you think they're faring on on, on walking this fine line? So I think um, it is a very fine line, and in some cases, it's one of those situations where you know you know it when you see it, but it's very hard to define. Um, I would say that the EU has launched a very comprehensive agenda um, of tech regulation and is also going through a process of strengthening its investment screening, thinking more about support for industries such as semiconductors. And uh, there's a whole raft of policy initiatives going on there. I do think that um, there are some individuals who would like to see this used in a protectionist way to ensure the growth of European companies. Uh, and to provide, if you will, a safe haven for them that's a little bit that is somewhat removed in certain industries from global competition. I actually don't think that's the case with uh, some key EU leaders and, and national leaders, and particularly uh, as as a whole, I think that some of our tech companies face very real challenges in this place, in that that place. And I would point to the Digital Markets Act, and we could go down that rabbit hole. But I do think, you know, the EU is the home of pooled sovereignty. This is the idea 
that you're better off together. You are more sovereign in the world together if you actually get together and cooperate. And I think that that is a powerful argument for the US and the EU to really start to cooperate on some of these uh, strategic industries and defense capabilities. There's one issue that's more, um, that is we need to make sure that American companies aren't being discriminated against in Europe. And that goes both on the defense side as well as the tech side. But there's been some very good conversations, particularly in the defense side, about how mechanisms to allow U.S. companies to participate more. And the Americans, of course, the U.S. government is not always uh, open in its defense industries as well to foreign companies. So we need to think about that. But what I would say is we now have a new innovation, the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. And one of the key working groups, a subgroup of that, is actually working on the semiconductor issue. And so I think we now have a forum where the US and the EU are talking about how to do this before things get set in stone. And I think that's a really good innovation because in at heart, I think we both have the same interests and we have the same intentions. We do need to figure out, as we both look at how to support our chips industry, for example, what's a good subsidy or an allowable subsidy under the WTO and what is not? What is allowable state aid? What is not? How do we support research and how do we not provide things that unfairly boost a particular company. And I think that those are discussions that we need to have in the TTC and elsewhere um, that will help us both be more strategic partners and more secure in, in these particular industries. Amy, can I just jump in and add something very quickly to what, what Francis just said? And that that is, we, we are, um, uh, first of all, very much agree with what you said, Francis. And um, this, this legislation I was talking about is called the CHIPS Act um, that would provide $52 billion, mostly for manufacturing incentives for uh, incentivizing more, more, more fabs being built in, in the U.S. We, we were very careful about making sure that legislation was agnostic in terms of nationality. Um, if you're a U.S. headquartered company or a foreign headquartered company, European headquartered company, you you can you can apply for the grants that would come out of this and the whole thing here is we do not want to create um uh barriers at the water's edge to innovation um it's just it's just a zero-sum game and and as mm -hmm. as europe contemplates its next moves on on how to how to deal with uh, uh key te key technologies like semiconductors I would suggest uh, that they, uh, Europe adopts the same approach as we have with the, with the CHIPS Act. So on the question of, 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 of funding for, for these industries, we've had an audience question come in from Mr. Chidaraki um, from Stephen in New York, who asks, can you explain a little bit more about the COVID recovery funds and tech allocation? Um, you also mentioned that certain countries are investing their own own funds for tech. Are there mechanisms in, in place to support countries with smaller economies to make this process a little bit more equitable? Yes. Um, maybe if you allow me 20 seconds to reflect a bit also on, on what Francis was saying and also John's intervention on, on, on the CHIPS Act. Uh, because, as you probably, I'm, I'm sure you know, we are on the EU side preparing our own CHIP Act, something that uh, President von der Leyen announced in the State of the Union speech already in September and was the big hoo ha uh, in, in that announcement. Of course, we will now see uh, whether we go down the same line as what John was saying earlier in terms of approach, but certainly... And here again, uh, I want to stress and, and support very much what Francis was saying. I think the TTC, now that it's launched, uh, is providing the perfect place where we can actually have these conversations before uh, we do certain things separately. So that, make, so that we make sure that even if we do things separately, for example, if we decide to regulate separately like we would do now on, on, on chips, that actually it makes sense and there is complementarity and, and cohesion between and coherence between between what we do. 
Um, and if we look also at the way the, the various working groups within the TTC have been set up and the kind of topics that each of them uh, has uh, and uh, the objectives that they have set up uh, to work with, uh, I think clearly the right, the right staging is there for us on the US and, uh, and the EU side to, to work better and to achieve those common goals based on those common values uh, that, that uh, Francis was also referring to, even if, um, and here I think we have to understand the fact that we will be probably taking also different paths sometimes, and we will apply different methods because also we have different cultures from the way we regulate also to the way we, we invest, to the way we relate with, with industry. And also two, two, uh, two words on talent, uh, because I actually missed answering to your first, uh, to your first question on this, and, and sorry about that. Um, I think John was mentioning earlier about the, the, the fact that the US uh, has an issue with, with, with the right talent. Well, I think the EU, I don't want to compare which one, which one of us actually has a big... <laughs> A bigger gap, but we certainly have a, a tremendous gap of talent. Uh, the Commission was estimating that by 2030, that gap would amount to about 10 million uh, in terms of how the uh, technology, how the industry, the economy will evolve, uh, in, uh, and also compared to how, if we keep status quo in terms of what our uh, universities and our schools produce. Uh, so clearly, this is a gap that we have to that we have to to uh, fill in, and we also have to worry. And I know that. Now, on the listening from the uh, other side of the Atlantic, it sounds differently. Uh, uh, but we also worry here in Europe, of course, about the, the uh, vast amount of talent that we lose to the U.S. Uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our students, a lot of our, of our researchers, a lot of our engineers, a lot of other, our in, uh, entrepreneurs who are starting up a business or scaling up a business then choose to go and continue it in the U.S., and that's something that has to give us food for thought, and it is giving us food for thought uh, to, to, to find the ways to actually keep them here, to stimulate them, to give them the right elements, uh, the right ingredients for them to find it interesting, attractive to, to stay here and, and compete from here. But also uh, an issue very important, which is indeed migration policies and legal migration policies, uh, which we also have to, to work with and of course, it's difficult politically because we are in this uh, sort of paranoia about migration these days. And I think that is true on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and somehow that prevents us from also thinking straight, thinking sanely about actually what we have to, to, to do to, to, to make that right. And now going to the to question about funding. Um, uh, the, the amount of funding for digital, of course, varies from one member state to member state. It is a threshold of 20% from the national package that is allocated under the uh, recovery uh, post-COVID fund for each member state, um, which also allows that even for smaller member states, which was your, your precise question, even for the smaller member states, given the size of the economy, that the amount of money that they have to put into digital is uh, at least to a minimum level uh, in order to stimulate that effect that we aim to have at European uh, at the European level. I was saying earlier that uh, there is also national investment that also varies very much from from one government to government, um, and certainly smaller member states would invest less. But if I am for example, to take the country that I know best, uh, which, is, which is Romania, but also other countries in Eastern Europe, which maybe don't have, let's say, the budgetary power of other fellow member states in the EU on, uh, in the West, but they do allocate now more and more uh, amounts of their, of their budget to digital research, to supporting digital um, industries, to now, now gearing towards battery production, battery recycling, semiconductors now, which of course is, be, is becoming the big buzzword um, so I am, again, there's never enough money, but I am now less concerned about the amount of money as I am concerned about the ability, in fact, of our, uh, of our companies, of our economies to adapt and absorb this money um, and to actually create those, those networks and, and those consortia that I was mentioning earlier, which EU wants to see, wants to have, so that, again, it plays out the internal the entire market of the, of the EU, because that is the only way we can actually compete properly. Um, and, and that is, from my point of view, the, the, the bigger concern I would have rather than, uh, again, the, the actual amount of, of euros that we put in. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comprehensive answer. And with that, we are unfortunately out of time today. 
I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us this morning and thank you so much for your insightful answers. Uh, before we begin, move on to our next session, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions that you may have through the Q&A box on the digital platform that you are viewing through or using the hashtag FPTechForum. I'm now delighted to welcome my colleague, Jack Detch, who's FP's Pentagon and National Security Reporter for the next segment. Jack, welcome to the virtual stage. Thanks, Amy, and uh, for an enlightening discussion. I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation now to look at cybersecurity threats and particularly how they're playing out on the geostrategic and geopolitical stage. And to do that with us today is Chelsea Slack. She's the deputy head of cyber defense at NATO. Uh, Chelsea, welcome to the program. And to start off, I'm just curious to get your sense of what NATO is actually doing on, on cyber, sort of what are the key initiatives that we should be paying attention to? Thank you so much, Jack, and allow me also to thank uh, Foreign Policy Magazine for the invitation to be with you in this inaugural uh, tech forum. So that's uh, it's really great to be here. Moving a bit back, the, the title of this conversation with Jack is, is Securing Cyberspace. And I think really what it comes down to is also securing the values that underpin cyberspace. NATO is a political military alliance that for nearly 75 years has been safeguarding those values in the physical world. And now those values also apply to cyberspace, including the notion of collective defense, which I know we'll get to uh, in the questions to come. NATO was founded on the notion that countries can do more when they work together. And the recently endorsed cyber defense policy, this is our first one in seven years, uh, as was highlighted by President Biden when he visited Brussels uh, for the Heads of State and Government Summit in June. It's the first in seven years, and really this policy embodies the notion of countries coming to NATO to work together. The policy recognizes that cyberspace is a contested space. It is a space that is always on, and so our efforts to engage must be as well. Allies have committed to being able to deter, defend against, and counter the full spectrum of cyber threats and malign actors. The new policy also recognizes NATO as a valuable platform for countries to come together to share information about their concerns, to enhance their national resilience at the individual level, but then also come to the table collectively to impose costs on actors who may do harm. The third thing the policy does is recognize that NATO is part of a broader community. And we engage with partners, not only different countries, but also other international organizations such as the European Union and also critically the private sector. Once again, recognizing this notion that countries can achieve more when they come together. And this is very much an issue that is now at the core of our thinking as we look at the competition that's playing out between states and in this multi-stakeholder space, recognizing that cyberspace technology issues really are at its core. And this latest policy that was endorsed at NATO is another step on this journey that we've been on, recognizing that those values in cyberspace also must be defended. I wanted to ask a little bit to, to dig in on what you mentioned about deterrence from a NATO perspective. How does that fit in uh, with cyber as an element of national power? And particularly since you're dealing with non-state actors often in the cybersecurity realm, as opposed to state-based actors that we saw in, in past conflicts and, and past periods of history like the Cold War. Thanks, Jack. Indeed. Allies have recognized that cyber is a core part of NATO's broader deterrence and defense posture. So it was back in 2014 when for the first time allies recognized that a cyber attack could be grounds to invoke Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. Since then, allies have been developing their capabilities, been exercising, been planning, working with partners to understand this space and to ensure that we are prepared to defend it. Now, you raise a point around the number of different actors in this space, and allies recognized that cyber threats are becoming more coercive, more destructive, and ever more frequent. And that it's not just states, but it's also non-state actors, as well as state-sponsored actors who are, who are active in this space. As the Secretary General has observed, nowhere is the fog of war thicker than it is in cyberspace. 
So allies have already recognized that cyber defense is part of NATO's core task of collective defense. But there's also the recognition, including with this new policy, that some of the tenets of deterrence in a traditional sense might not apply as well in this space, given cyberspace's specificity. So what does that mean? The new policy recognizes cyberspace as a contested space, one there is, where there is constant activity and action. So we need to be more proactive in the way that we respond whether it's responding to states or also to non-state actors. And so through this policy, using NATO as a platform to share information, to share concerns about threats that may be facing allies, regardless of who the actor may be, and to then consider possible collective responses in order to uphold this rules-based order in cyberspace, which allies have committed to. So I think more broadly, it's looking at how cyber is part of NATO's broader deterrence and defense posture, which of course includes Article 5, but it's also looking at the policy work we've been doing, especially with this new cyber defense policy in 2001 to 2021, which looks at this broader notion of campaigns, malicious activities uh, that are constant and that we need to respond to. I'd be curious to know a little bit more about how you're being proactive in, in the response. And then specifically, uh, when you look at collective self-defense and, and NATO's Article 5, uh, what rises to the level of an act of war in the cyber domain? <laughs> One of the most hotly debated topics, Jack. Um, indeed. So when we look at how allies are developing their capabilities nationally, uh, enhancing their own resilience to respond to the range of threats and the range of actors uh, that we find in this space. Uh, one important tool that allies are using is our Cyber Defense Pledge, which was uh, endorsed by heads of state and government back in 2016. So this is a tool, it's five years uh, into its implementation now, and it sees allies looking across the broad spectrum of how they develop their capability, their partnerships with industry, uh, their public awareness, programs to really ensure this whole of government approach and this awareness also at the political level uh, of the need to have situational awareness to then inform decision making. Take that then into the NATO context of the 30 allies sitting around uh, the table. What's uh, very clear is that allies have recognized that a cyber threat could be grounds to invoke Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. But as in the other domains, we don't prejudge a response. So there's no automaticity because fundamentally any decision to invoke Article 5 or that would reach that threshold would be a political decision taken on a case by case basis, depending on that specific context. Allies have made clear that any response would, of course, be uh, in line with international law and NATO's defensive mandate, but that importantly, too, the response is not limited in kind to cyber. So we call it a cross domain approach, which is why coming to this proactive notion, when you meant what's important is this notion of broadening out the toolbox. So Yes, NATO as a political military alliance has military capabilities at its disposal, but a lot of these issues, especially the more below the threshold cyber activities, other tools uh, can be brought to bear, be them in diplomatic, political, economic, uh, or military channels. So I think uh, the bottom line to all of that is that allies have an important role individually, that they're planning to enhance uh, their, their capabilities and their defenses. And they're also using NATO collectively at the, as this platform where they can share concerns, consult, and should their be eventualities, uh, they can consult on Article 5, uh, more generally on Article 4, or just use NATO as a platform uh, for responses and information sharing. So just just given that, you know, there's a long decision making process to to response and that you're looking at a case by case basis, as you said, just as a baseline, how is NATO looking to impose costs and, and rules of the road in, in such a complex domain like cyber again that we were talking about? That's not only comprised of state based actors, but you're dealing with non state actors and, of course, think people that entities that aren't typically deterred by by normal state activity. Absolutely. So. Uh... 
one of the things uh, that we've placed great premium on is this notion of consultation so that allies bring concerns to the table, uh, that we improve our channels for information sharing and exchange so that we really have this up-to-date situational awareness of, of what's happening. Uh, one key way that allies are working together in this sense is through exercises, for example. Uh, so just in a couple of weeks, we have our flagship cyber defense exercise taking place in Estonia. Uh, last year, more than a thousand cyber defenders from across the lines, but also in including partner countries uh, took part uh, in this in this endeavor and really this is precisely uh, to test consultation procedures to test decision making uh, and to make sure that we're looking at the range of different threats and actors in this space and that we have the capacity and the information sharing channels uh, to be able to respond so writ large the work that we're doing also in our planning in our doctrine and in broader exercising really important for as you said making sure that uh, we have the right information at our fingertips so that when decisions need to be taken, they can be taken in, in a swift manner. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the expansion of uh, the cyber domain into the physical domain. We've seen uh, renewed attacks on critical infrastructure, both in the United States uh, and in the near abroad. And I'm curious just how NATO's thinking about that problem. And then just when you look in the context of collective defense and the notion of, of active war, where the critical infrastructure problem kind of fits into some of those problem sets. Yeah, so you mentioned also NATO as a platform and how we impose costs uh, for, for some of this activity. And uh, a couple of examples, I think really this, once again, going back to the beginning of the discussion, is really about those values, about the rules of the road and how we enforce them. So there have been a few incidents, instances as of late where allies have uh, issued uh, statements where they condemn malicious cyber activities. The first uh, being last year in the context of the pandemic, when we were seeing uh, increasing malicious cyber activity targeting those sectors that were critical to pandemic response. Um, so allies issued uh, through the North Atlantic Council a statement condemning those activities, be they supported by states, uh, non-states or otherwise. I think another example of this um, more recently uh, comes from the next statement from this past summer, uh, where allies once again came together to share concerns over malicious cyber activity, uh, writ large, but also looking specifically at the Microsoft Exchange server compromise. And a statement was once again uh, issued, which set out uh, the behavior that allies found to be unacceptable and not in line with responsible state behavior, that acknowledged some of the national attributes made by allies for this activity and that called on all states uh, to uphold their commitments and obligations under international law and to abide by those norms of responsible state behavior. So I think looking at the threat landscape, uh, it's how dynamic it is, but also the range of different actors, what's important is that uh, we're using NATO as this platform for countries to share this information, to work together and to collectively decide uh, to uphold this rules-based international order in cyberspace. Chelsea, you mentioned the cyber defense policy. I'm curious what you're hoping the next steps from the alliance will be uh, from the from the member states on cyber after that. Well, it's, uh, it's an important time at NATO more generally because, of course, we have uh, discussions currently on the development of a new strategic concept for NATO, looking towards the Madrid summit next year. Uh, the last strategic concept uh, was from 2010, which was actually the first recognition that cyber threats could reach a threshold uh, that would threaten Euro-Atlantic prosperity, security and stability. So we've really been on a journey and come uh, a long way from that moment. Uh, but of course, there's, there's more work to be done. Um, and so so it's in that spirit that this new policy in the fact that it recognizes cyberspace is contested, that our policy responses need to align to that. Uh, the fact that it puts a premium on allies individually developing their own resilience, but then also using NATO as this platform to collectively impose costs and take action where necessary. And that it's also a platform where allies can exchange with partners, where we can work with other international organizations such as the European Union, and critically also with uh, the private sector. So I see this uh, policy as, as an important step in that journey and moving forward, I think discussions around the strategic concept will look at how cyberspace and technology, emerging disruptive technologies more generally, are really at the heart of this strategic competition that, that we see and the policy responses uh, that we need to develop moving forward.
I wanted to turn to just one question from the audience. Uh, we had a question about how will NATO deal with threats to cybersecurity that, pre that are presented by quantum computing? Curious to get your thoughts on that. Great question. So indeed, this this uh, links very closely with some of the broader thinking that NATO has been doing around uh, emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, there is a, a strategy that has several different technology areas, uh, including quantum, autonomy, AI, data. And at the recent meeting of defense ministers in October, uh, allies uh, approved their very first uh, strategy in artificial intelligence, including uh, principles of responsible use. But they will also increasingly be looking at those technologies, including quantum, that are mentioned. Of course, with all technology, a uh, double-edged sword in the sense that, of course, we see benefits uh, to helping cyber defenders uh, better protect and respond to incidents using some of these technologies. But then, of course, uh, on the flip side of that, um, it can make the, the job much harder uh, as, as these technologies develop further. Uh, so. The short answer is that emerging disruptive technologies, once again, at the very core of the policy debate here at NATO, especially looking towards the strategic concept in Madrid uh, next year at the summit, and that we continue to follow these developments, work also very closely with the private sector and academia to understand where these technologies are going and the implications uh, at the political level, but also the military and technical levels. Chelsea, you mentioned strategic competition in your work towards a new strategic concept. Uh, I'm curious, since there's so much buzz in, in Washington about greater focus on China, I know that's something the Alliance is looking at as well. How is that manifesting in the cyber domain? And as you're looking towards the new strategic concept, how do you think that will be represented there? Yes, well, the NATO Secretary General has referred to the fact that, that we do find ourselves in a more competitive world. And so, as with the physical space, uh, this is also playing out in, in cyberspace. And I mentioned some of the steps that we've taken through this new policy to recognize the environment for what it is. It is an environment that is constantly on, it is constantly being contested, um, and an absence uh, of activity does not necessarily mean there's peace. There's really a blurring uh, between peace, conflict, and crisis. So. So our thinking uh, through this uh, 2021 policy has really been to recognize that strategic space for what it is and then to ensure that we're developing policy responses commensurate to that. Using NATO as a platform to discuss various national approaches because of course uh, we always take note of what's going on in national debates in capitals uh, around some of these broader geopolitical issues and uh, of course moving forward to the strategic concept as all the allies will be coming to the table to negotiate that uh, we will see issues not only technical technology cyber, but more geopolitical uh, issues uh, take take the stage. So all to say that uh, it'll be a very interesting discussion that unfolds with cyber and technology once again at the heart. And you mentioned earlier that a, a response from NATO might not be limited to the cyber domain if there were a response to a, to a cyber attack. I'm curious how that would play out and sort of the, the intellectual discussions you're having at NATO headquarters about how, how the alliance would respond if it might not be a cyber attack for a cyber attack, what the other options might be. Yes, so we have been, uh, through our exercises, scenario planning, uh, doctrine development, really looking at the broad uh, the broad spectrum of the threat landscape. And uh, through those exercises, including Cyber Coalition, which I mentioned, are really valuable for getting people in the same room, understanding the problem set, and then seeing what tools we have at our disposal and what more we may wish to develop, either individually as allies or collectively uh, as, as, as NATO. Uh, one of the initiatives that uh, we've been working on quite closely uh, is what we call our NATO guide for, for strategic response options to malicious cyber activities. Um, I mentioned that we have um, policies in place uh, for decades around the Article 5 notion and now cyber defense applies in that context, but really once again looking at the strategic space of these campaigns of malicious cyber activities what policy responses uh, could could be brought to bear. And so here, looking at everything from diplomatic measures, uh, from messaging, signaling, uh, to economic measures, which of course NATO can't impose sanctions, uh, however allies can, to diplomatic measures. So looking across the toolbox of the various instruments of state power, and then allies using NATO as this platform to consult and to decide collectively uh, how they may wish to respond. 
Another important piece to this puzzle is, of course, cooperation with other actors. And so here we've been doing a lot of work, especially in the context of our cooperation with uh, the European Union, to look at the crisis, the cyber aspects of crisis management. So what are the different tools of the various organizations, for example, the EU Cyber Diplomacy Toolbox, and how might these tools complement one another, respecting, of course, that the mandates of the organizations are different. But given we're all uh, facing the same threat landscape uh, in many ways, ways, how we build synergies also with other policy tools and other organizations, and also very importantly, how we work with industry, academia to understand this space, and especially when it comes to actionable information exchange, to make sure that we have uh, as robust channels for that exchange as possible. Chelsea, we just have about a minute left, so just one last question from the audience. Um, we're curious about what role cyber attacks could perform to augment a conventional conflict. And uh, is NATO thinking at all about how to build analog fallback systems uh, if things go wrong? In recognizing cyberspace as a domain of operations in 2016, this was really uh, to understand that while cyber space has always been seen as an enabling domain, it is also a domain in and of itself. And so the work that we've been doing around operationalizing this notion of cyberspace as a domain, how are cyber aspects being mainstreamed across the very various work strands at NATO? Uh, what do our doctrine, our planning, our training, our, our exercises, how do the more traditional exercisers, the traditional domains, how are they incorporating cyber aspects and vice versa? And this is precisely to account for the types of scenarios that, that you're, that you're that, that you alluded to. So I think the short answer is that uh, the recognition of cyberspace as a domain in 2016 and the work that's been done also to um, integrate those effects offered by allies, because like other domains, NATO doesn't own the capability per se, uh, those effects are integrated by allies. This is all within the consideration that we need to be just as effective in cyberspace as we are in the air on land and at sea, and that cyberspace is a domain and ensuring that cyber aspects are integrated across alliance missions and operations is a central piece in that. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for your time. And just as we've been talking about new and emerging technology threats, uh, we're going to focus on in our next segment what policymakers and other global leaders should know as they're looking at new technology front frontiers, such as artificial intelligence, and how we ensure that powerful tools can be leveraged for positive social impact. So to moderate our next panel, I'm happy to welcome to the forum veteran journalist and former CNN anchor Maggie Lake. Maggie, take it away. Thanks so much, Jack. And hello, everyone. Before we start with our next panel, I would first like to welcome Annalise Riles to the stage. Annalise is the executive director of Northwestern University's Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. They're working on taking global and multidisciplinary approaches to solving some of the world's most pressing challenges. And you can be sure technology has certainly been one of the focus areas. Annalise, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So, you know, we are living in what many are calling the exponential age. You know, new technologies are advancing at such a rapid pace. How are academic institutions uniquely positioned to take the long view on, on issues like the development of tech regimes? What can, what can they bring to the table? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, we uh, are not beholden to business cycles. We're not beholden to election cycles. Our charge is really to think about the big picture and the long view. And also remember that we are the site of training the next generation of global leaders. And so we also have the opportunity to aggregate and elevate the voices of youth in these conversations. And then I think the third piece is that, you know, universities are very locally rooted institutions. Uh, a lot of us have a place name like Cambridge or Oxford or California in our, in our name but we're also deeply globally networked. Uh, we've been working together for generations across uh, political divides, across cultural differences, linguistic divides. And so we bring that networked global uh, approach. Uh, and, um, and we're really talking much more now about seeing ourselves as a, a global actor like, um, like the nation states on the stage that can provide uh, a coordinated uh, a coordinated answer to some of these global challenges. And, and in particular, we at Northwestern are the hosts of something called the U7 Plus Alliance of Global Universities, which is uh, an alliance of 
of um, about 50 of the top universities in the G7 countries and beyond, uh, working with multilateral organizations like the G7, and uh, technology and AI is one of our very top priorities. Yeah, and it's so needed because technology is 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 cross border. It doesn't doesn't know or respect boundaries. So it's so critical to be having that kind of conversation. Um, how important is establishing a common set of digital innovation principles and ethics around technology? And, and is that an area that you're looking at where you believe that universities and academia can really play a role? Absolutely. Um, we think that uh, what is really needed in this space now are some common global standards for the ethical development and implementation of AI, emphasizing the positive dimensions and hopefully addressing some of the challenges. And that the best way of approaching that is from a global perspective that recognizes that different regions of the world, different levels of development have different technological challenges and needs. Mm -hmm. And that uh, universities in particular, because we um, have nothing but the interests of the common global good at heart, can provide a platform for integrated global uh, standards setting. And so one of the things that we've done with uh, the U7 Plus is to establish a new institute. We call it Haiku, the uh, AI Plus Lab for Human-Centered AI for Colleges and, and Universities, uh, trying to develop those standards collaboratively across, across the globe. Yeah, it's so important to start building those bridges. I feel like time is of the essence as we see everything sort of exploding around us. Annalise, thanks so much for being with us. Annalise is the executive director, again, of Northwestern University's Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. Thanks so much. And what a great way to kick off uh, the conversation for all of us. Let's unpack some of these themes and welcome our panel. Uh, joining us is Sunita Grote, lead at UNICEF Ventures, VS Subramania, Walter P. Murphy, Professor of Computer Science and Fellow at Northwestern Roberta Institute for Global Affairs, and Dr. Rand Waltzman, Adjunct Senior Information Scientist at the Rand Corporation. Thank you all for being with us today. And if you haven't already, just remember to, to uh, take your mute off. Um, Rand, I'd like to start with you. You know, AI is such a big topic. I think it's worth kind of getting an assessment. Where are we in the development of AI? What aspect of, of this technology are you watching most closely right now? Well, so that really heavily, you know, where we are heavily depends on what the application or what the specific type of technology is, because it's really all over the place. I mean, what people mostly hear about in the news and in, in, in reporting when they hear about AI is, is statistical machine learning, which is one very specific kind of technology. But it turns out AI is a much bigger field than statistical machine learning. And an interesting example, especially in the areas that I worry about, has to do with something called affective computing. So affective computing is something, well, I, my experience is that most people have never actually heard of, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very powerful area. And it has to do with how machines can, can actually read and generate emotions. So, you know, can a, can a machine actually read the expression in your face, read the emotions in your face? And could it then take, for example, an avatar, an automated, very you know, realistic looking figure and generate facial expressions that actually convey emotion? So there's a whole, and that's it was is that Hoyer. happening now? Is that actually? Yes, it's been around for a long. It's been around for a long time. The field. Uh. I mean, there's, there's some very well known groups, but these are not they're not the popular things, but they will be. I guarantee you, because as we go into as the information environment evolves into what people call the metaverse, which, by the way, that term was introduced in 1992. So this is not a new <laughs> term either, but. Uh, but I would say now people are starting to put really serious money into it. And so as serious money goes into it, it's, I think it's on the verge of actually becoming the thing that people talked about since 1992 and actually before that. I mean, some of you may remember Second Life, for example, which was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but, but there exist environments in the gaming world. There exist virtual and reality environments. And so on. But in those environments, you know, a machine, one of the things that AI is going to be able to do is actually to hold conversations with people for purposes, for not so nice purposes. I mean, disinformation, influence operations is about to come to an entirely different plane of existence than we've been familiar with it up to now. And some of the enabling technologies for that are, for example, affective computing techniques, among others. 
Well, well, that, that's a, it's a kind of chilling statement because I, I think we're all, you know, feeling the weight and the pain uh, and, and, you know, the last year, year and a half, two years has really underscored the issue and problems with misinformation, disinformation, um, and, and not not casual, you know, targeted, uh, intentional uh, misinformation. VS, uh, so we, we see these, the, the technology is advancing. And, and as Rand pointed out now, you know, we're knocking on the door of the metaverse. Now we all know about it. Not, not just, not just all of you, um, including by the way, everyone, you know, Justin Bieber is having a concert in the metaverse. So if anybody didn't know about it before, they will now. I'm sure all of you have your tickets, but, um, this is happening, right? And, and for all of us, including adults, children, um, how far behind, cause I know they are, how far behind are policymakers and regulators when it comes to wrapping their head around these developments? Well, thank you, Maggie. So uh, let me start by saying, extending a little bit of what Rand said in terms of how disinformation is just going to explode. So when we think about uh, disinformation campaigns, there are two major themes to them. One, how do you generate content that people react to and get engaged with? And second, how do you get this spreading through the network? So in other words, when you put out a fake story, if you're a bad guy, you think, how do I get this to spread virally through the network? And there are going to be dramatic uh, advances in the next few years on both of those. Many of them have already happened. So on the content side, as Rand mentioned, there is now the ability to generate emotion text, which conveys certain emotions on certain topics and other emotions on other topics. You can do the same with images. You can combine the two to generate very, very compelling uh, imagery, video, and more with the right emotions. But in addition, the adversary is going to do a number of things. You know, the uh, uh, malicious hackers involved in these influence campaigns. Rather than do what they did many years ago, um, they're going to preposition assets in the network, embed nodes in the network, uh, fake accounts, and so forth, that are intended to spread such news over an extended period of time. So these accounts are going to be sitting in these networks for years, perhaps, before they go live in a very active way. They're going to continuously modify the attack surface. So today, techniques used to carry out, uh, to detect bots, fake news, assume that they are generated according to a certain model. But the attackers are going to continuously change that model so that we, the defenders, trying to identify these malicious campaigns are kept off balance. They're going to do things like throw cannon fodder at us. Uh, so in the old days of warfare, you know, the initial battle waves would be, you know, expendable soldiers who would go out in the Middle Ages and fight their opponents and die. And at some point, the course of the battle would become clear. So there are going to be accounts like this, which are intended to be discovered by the defenders of these social spheres with the intent that those models that the defenders learned from these initial waves of cannon fodder are going to leave them unprepared to defend against the next waves, which are going to evolve and be different. So policymakers are way behind the curve on this, uh, both in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, they are aware of some of these possibilities for sure, but the state of legislation has not gotten anywhere near where we need it to be. Yeah, which is which is what I fear. And, and, and often, you know, what we say, no matter what area of technology we're looking at, uh, you know, there is a a disconnect between the pace at which po regulation of politics moves right now and and with the technology that's just leapfrogging it every day. Sunita, you know, it, it, talk to us a little bit about uh, UNICEF Ventures and how you're approaching AI, because it's it's very easy to get to get into sort of a very dark, scary space immediately when you look at the threats. But how are you approaching this and, and how are you trying to leverage this technology? Yeah, I think um absolutely agree. This this overview has definitely, you know, shed light on some of the risks. Um we're really focused on trying to see what the opportunities might be uh that different technology spaces, not just AI, uh, could present for accelerating results for children. So that's sort of the the role of the ventures team doing some of the very early piloting and explorations across different technology areas. And we've been looking at AI and data science for a couple of years now, um, and really primarily are doing this through our venture fund that provides seed funding. 
to startups that are uh, in emerging and developing markets that might be developing and exploring these sorts of technology applications. And from our experience, we've seen so far that AI can really add value to the work that UNICEF does um, in a number of ways. And maybe just on a, on a slight side note for those that might be less familiar with UNICEF's work, we are the UN agency that focuses on children, um, basically using the Convention of the Rights of the Child to um, realize the rights of children all around the world. Um, and so, you know, our team has been looking at, at leveraging AI and piloting solutions across a number of different areas. Some of those include, for instance, you know, improving our capacity to analyze large data sets to provide new or better insights that allow us to plan and respond better to the needs of children. So you can imagine, for instance, you know, looking and predicting into the spread of epidemics, obviously highly relevant for the last couple of months, but also looking at, you know, what is the impact of some of the policies that were put in place in response to COVID-19, so mobility restrictions, school closures, etc., um, and mapping infrastructure as well. So we have a platform called Project Connect, where we've mapped every school in the world and its connectivity status, really to help governments assess what the needs might be for certain services, in this case, connectivity. The second um, area that we've explored is around the is providing information and engagement at scale. So really, um, you know, looking, for instance, at how chatbots can help us engage a large volume of young people and their communities and in providing um, interactive information. Again, uh, you can imagine after a disaster, for instance, on a, or on an ongoing basis to engage them in discussion um, around crucial issues that affect affect their lives, personalizing and making it. Uh, information and content more accessible. So you can imagine children with disabilities and the particular needs they face in terms of being able to have access to content. Um, but also just as more children are learning online these days, looking at how learning journeys can be personalized. How can I ensure that the right child is provided with the right kind of content and information to, you know, really accelerate their learning outcomes and, and make sure that they that they have access to the right, the right stuff um, that they need. And then finally, looking also at how we can improve the efficiency and safety of all sorts of remote service delivery and online engagement. So again, really an area that's just emerged as increasingly important after the last 18 months, where we've seen education, health, financial transactions, all of these services moving increasingly online. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, uh, we've been working most recently on, a, on an app called Kindly, together with a young woman called Gitanjali Rao. Um, and that's an open source IP API that uses machine learning to detect cyber bullying intent in anything kind of text-based messages online. So those are those are some of the areas that we've seen where AI can really add value. Yeah. But just as a last note, kind of fundamental to our approach has been this recognition that there is um, really massive gaps in how AI is currently being developed and used. Uh, we're seeing kind of a technology gap around the world, a capacity gap, a data gap that fundamentally shapes what kind of AI solutions we're seeing on the market for what purpose. And based on whose needs. Um, certain people's needs are just not reflected. Their voices are just not heard in the data sets that are training um, a lot of these solutions that we see. And so one of the main aims that we have is trying to address that imbalance and that gap to make sure that the opportunities that the technology has can also serve others um, that so far may have not been so well represented. Yeah, that is a, a fantastic point, And that is so, so critical. Um, and I think one of the risks of, of falling behind in the conversation, Rand, I just want to pick up on that because, you know, it's such a counter to the risk when you hear about some of the ways that UNICEF is looking to use this. How do we need to think about it? Is 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 it the underlying technology that poses the risk or is it the actors using it? Because it, it, it's an important distinction. Always the actors. Yeah. I mean, when you take as an example of, you know, the kind of imbalance there is, think about surveillance technologies. They have computer vision systems, facial recognition systems, activity recognition systems. This technology is, is huge. And one of the reasons is because the market of it for it is enormous. So, I mean, we're talking about, you know, enormous sums of money being invested is because there is enormous markets uh, to buy the technology. So many people would consider uh, many uses of that technology not very positive. Of course, there are positive uses of surveillance technology as well. But um, one of the more interesting uh, applications of AI technology for, from a positive perspective was something in the 1980s during the last big wave of AI. You're now in the third wave. The second wave, which was in the 80s, um, the main theme was about the distribution of expertise, cheap, low-cost distribution of expertise. You know, in those days, they were called expert systems. And, um, you know, the idea was to capture human expertise, capture it in a program, 
and actually be then able to widely distribute the program, make the expertise available to everybody and anybody. So, for example, if you were in a, you know, in a third world country where you didn't have any doctors, could you actually have systems that could help do diagnosis mm -hmm. automatically? Or, I mean, one of the most popular systems of the day was something that, that analyzed loans for banks, for example. So we had a few people, key people, who really understood about, you know, deciding loans, and you had all these junior people sitting in the branches. Well, they made an expert system at the time that, you know, uh, somebody in a branch could use that walked them through and helped them do the analysis. So, you know, they, they took, you know, one person's expertise and made it distributed to large numbers of people. Yeah. So, so that's another area. So, but again, it's a mixed bag. You can use these things. All these things are neutral. All this technology is neutral. It can be used for good, can be used for bad, can be used for everything in between. Yeah. So well, that's it, the real point. It, it is. It, it, it's so important to say that. But VS, when we look at the on the policy side, and again, I think this is where multilateral organizations, universities, academia can kind of plug in and be a bridge. Because when you look at the regulation, when you look at policy around it, we have a tendency to demonize the technology, which confuses people. And 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 then you kind of create this battle with private companies uh, and, and it, it, you know, who say you're stifling innovation and, and we get nowhere. You know, how, how do we break through that that problem so that we can mitigate the risk without stifling innovation and make sure we're all talking about the right thing? Because there are positive uses. Uh, that's right, Maggie. So, again, you know, I want to reiterate the point that Rand made. It's usually not the technology that's good or bad. It's the intent of the actor who uses that technology in a specific use case. So yes, so there are, you know, so let's take an example with fakes. So I think we all agree that fakes are bad. Um, you know, there are, you know, we don't want fake handbags. We don't want fake news. Fakes are bad. Fakes are bad. We hear this all the time. But fakes can also be used for good. And let me give you an example of theft of intellectual property. So we hear reports about theft of intellectual property from U.S. companies virtually every day. Okay. And um, so if you're a U.S. company, you can now use technology that we've developed, that others have developed, that take intellectual property being developed within the country to generate multiple fake versions of a document that resides within the company's networks. So think, you're a researcher or a scientist or an engineer for a major corporation. You're developing some valuable invention. So you generate the invention but then there are systems that will work with you to generate, say, 99 fake versions of the invention. Okay? Is that good or bad? Well, when the attacker, a cyber attacker, comes and steals this information from your company, they now have to incur significant costs to separate the real document from the fake ones. And that is a good use of fakes. It's a use which only imposes costs on individuals who are carrying out an offensive cyber action. So AI is used to generate these kinds of things. Let me give you another example, um, malware. So the way the malware ecosystem works is malicious hackers create a piece of malware, say a criminal network somewhere, they put it out, it gathers significant revenues for the developer of the malware over a period of time. But at some point, the major cybersecurity firms, the Symantec's and the McAfee's of the world, figure out that this is malware and they start blocking it. Uh, using a bunch of technical instruments. So the malware developer goes off and then tweaks his malware a little bit to evade these signatures, and the whole cycle continues over and over again. Malware developer tweaks, cybersecurity companies tweak their response, malware developer tweaks again, and this goes on and on. Instead, it would be much better if we got ahead of the malware developers as the good guys. Can we take the malware we've seen so far uh, from a certain family of malware and develop automatically the next 10,000 versions of it. These malware variants may never exist in the future, but then we can build robust defenses that get us to protect not just against those 10,000, many of which may never come into being in the wild, but which give us much more robust defenses. So these are two examples where AI techniques can be used for good by generating synthetic um, documents, technical documents, synthetic patents, which are stored within a network to in embed, uh, to incur, you know, inflict costs on the attacker, yeah. protect networks better. Yeah. I, I, by the way, I'm fascinating. I, I've never heard that, never thought about it. 
I mean, because we could call them decoys too, <laughs> instead of fakes, because it has a little bit more of a positive connotation. Um, you know, but it does underscore trying to, you know, separate out the, the, the difference between the actual underlying technology and the actors. So Nina, I know UNICEF is really focused on the development process. You managed before the big gaps when it comes to what's not being captured. So much of this this has happened in a sort of small sphere in the private sector within private companies. What is it about the development process that you would like to see change? And can you walk us through what you mean by digital public goods? I've, I've heard you refer to that in the past. What does that mean? And how can that, um, you know, help shine some light on what, what could be possible here? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, we as a team and, and our venture fund is always taken the approach of investing or providing support exclusively to open source um, solutions. And that's really based on on 10 plus years of experience of having piloted solutions and, and scaled those solutions across our programs, um, again, across different technology areas. And the reason why we um, took that approach in particular is, you know, it has several reasons. One of them, it, it makes business sense. Um, we have seen actually that solutions or business models that back open source solutions are far more diverse, can be more sustainable depending on sort of what, what indicators we look at. And actually it also allows a far more diverse set of actors to leverage the benefits of different products and solutions. And, you know, just coming back to this idea of filling gaps and imbalances, that's been a really, um, really central to our approach in doing so. It also enables us and government partners to scale solutions more quickly, adapt them, localize them for their particular needs. Um, and so it can be also more cost efficient, depending on depending on the on the particular scaling journey that it might take. It helps generate collaboration and sort of efficiencies at the product level. So at the solution level, just if we think of an AI solution that, you know, may consist of a training data set, an algorithm itself, and maybe some sort of interface or insight that it generates, right? All of these things could be open and can be built upon, can be leveraged for different solutions for different contexts, and can also lead to more insight into the actual quality behind a particular solution. Um, and you know, finally, it's also from a principled perspective based on the fact that we believe that public funds should generate public goods. So if we're using public funds, um, we should be uh, making those resources available and those results available to anyone who, who could um, get benefit from them. And this term digital public goods um, refers specifically to um, a term that's been endorsed by the UN Secretary General in his roadmap on digital corporation. And it acknowledges that currently access to digital technology and therefore their potential in accelerating achievement of the sustainable development goals is really hampered by um, a lot of the, the fact that a lot of those solutions are closed, they're inaccessible to those that, who need them most. And so he's put out a call to various stakeholders to make more available digital solutions, data sets, algorithms, content um, as open source solutions so that we can really come together to accelerate the sustainable development goals um, and their achievement in the timeline in the time that we have. And so we've been um, very pleased and very proud to see that really, you know, our experience Experience has been kind of uh, has has informed that approach, um, mm -hmm. and that we're seeing that being picked up at a global level now. We, uh, together with the governments of Norway, Sierra Leone, and an Indian think tank called iSpirit, launched what's called the Digital Public Goods Alliance, which aims to identify um, and scale digital public goods across the sustainable development goals. And really there, the aim is to really highlight and make more visible and accessible these kinds of solutions, but also to fill the gaps that currently exist in that space from a technology point, point from, a, from a financing standpoint and from a policy development standpoint. So helping governments identify how can they in their own engagement with their entrepreneurial ecosystems encourage the development of these kinds of solutions according to these sorts of technical standards? How can they, when they look at public procurement processes, understand when and where the procurement of digital public goods might be to an advantage from a technology perspective, from a scaling perspective, um, but also from a value perspective in terms of being able to capture some of that value for local ecosystems and economic development. And so that's really where this term digital public goods um, comes in. And, and in our you know, understanding is really crucial to making sure that these solutions are more accessible and available um, across yeah. different contexts. That, that's incredibly important, incredibly important to have that alliance. Um, for anyone who wants more information on that, please, I'm sure that um, Sunita would be happy to share that because it is the beginning. We've seen the progress once you can 
coalesce around something and it is exactly where we need to be focusing our energy and the finance is so important. So I encourage you to go, go check that out. Rand, um, we have a question coming in from Patrick. How will AI and quantum computing impact disinformation challenges such as synthetic media? So, so, so I'm, I'm going to go back to the, to the metaverse example, or the, the situation, right? So what I would say about that, first of all, is, you know, you think you've seen problems with disinformation up to now. Well, believe me, you haven't seen anything yet. Because what one of the enabling technology, what the technology will enable in this kind of environment is very highly personalized, very highly targeted types of manipulation. So, for example, what I was talking about, affective computing, I mean, all disinformation, all of this propaganda and everything is all based on emotional manipulation, all of it. It has nothing to do with facts or reality or anything else. It's all about manufactured reality and manipulation. So any kind of technology that supports, guess what, emotional manipulation, which a lot of AI technology can be used for, is going to become a big problem. You know, it, 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 let me ask you something, Rand. Um, having having spent a long time in the news and heard my fair share of complaints around this, the news is always bad. You always tell about talk about disasters. You're trying to scare us. And, you know, that's what sells, right? It was the headline of newspapers when print was in. It's the, you know, turn on any TV, uh, you know, news channel now. And you're going to see a lot of that. Um, and then maybe a little snippet of good news at the end. We, we've done this forever. Is it is it scarier now because of what the technology, the speed with which this operates and the fact there are so few checks on it? What makes this different and more perilous in your mind? Yes, it's, it's, it's a lot more deadly, more targeted, more effective. I mean, what changes is the scale, the, you know, the speed, you know, spatial extent, temporal compression, all of these things, they, they introduce qualitative changes in what, what you can do. And so the problem is that, you know, Okay, I'm I'm telling people scary things. The problem is you say, well, that's what sells. Well, the problem is it doesn't sell. Mm. It doesn't sell at all. Because, for example, if you look at the mess we have in social media today, I mean, I ran a program at DARPA from 2011 to 15, and I was carrying on about this right now. Okay, so nobody wanted to hear it. Yeah. Nobody was interested. I mean, I ran a $50 million program. It's a great program. VS was part of it. You know, 200 publications, and nobody in the government wanted to hear anything about it. They waited, they waited to even pay attention until it was way too late. So, yeah, so the answer is it does not sell. Yeah, it doesn't right. sell to the people that actually have to make the decisions. That's the real problem. Right. It's so important. VS, I see you shaking your head. This, this question, I think, is related. So maybe you want to want to. Um take a shot at this one. Um, this one coming in from India. With a greater adoption of deep fake algorithms, how can we increase confidence in differentiating deep fakes from real footage? This is interesting, especially in creating falsified evidence. How can we equip the courts to be able to detect such attempts? Very important, again, given what we've seen over the past year and the importance of everyone with a smartphone and the impact that can make, not only in, uh, in, in legal cases, but in the court of public opinion. Great question, Maggie. So I think, you know, the way we've got to, we've got to realize that guys doing these things are extremely innovative, extremely creative, and they're always going to come up with methods that we did not think about, you know, uh, earlier on. So a big amount of effort has got to be to put ourselves in the shoes of the bad guy now. And so that we can think of how the bad guy might operate in the future and get ahead of that. Our current legislation and government doesn't always support that. So even if you think about uh, reports of vulnerabilities, uh, independent hackers, for example, whether they use AI or not, discover vulnerabilities and report them to a company, oftentimes the first thing that the company does is to threaten to sue them rather than actually fix the problem. Mm. So we've got to make it possible for independent researchers, universities, government labs, to look at what threats are going to come down against us. It really is all about understanding the adversary, a concept that's gone back all the way, you know, hundreds of years to Sun Tzu, who told us that the man who knows himself and his adversary will basically do a lot better than the man or the army that either knows itself or knows its adversary, but not both. We've got to understand our adversary, put ourselves in the shoes of the adversary. We've got to have the kinds of social wind tunnels in which we can test what the adversary might do well before they actually do it and come up with protective measures for it. We need to support that at the policy level, at the political level, and beyond. 
Sunita, how important is education in all of this and, and sort of related, um, how can we achieve more diversity, not only ethically, uh, gender, you know, from a global perspective to participate in this conversation? Because I think many worry that the power rests in the hands of few and there's not much diversity within that group. Yeah, I think that lack of diversity is reflected on so many levels when it comes to a lot of emerging technologies, but specifically with AI, there is some some particular pitfalls. And we talked about some of those earlier on with right? the fact that AI solutions are fundamentally trained on data and depending on what you put in, um, you know, will fully shape what you get out of it. Um, I think that's, you know, that's a big gap we see. And one of the areas that UNICEF has been exploring is this concept of algorithmic equity to really be able to assess how diverse and how equitable the data sets themselves are that we train these solutions on. Um, you know, the other piece that we're seeing and my colleagues from, you know, UNICEF's Office of Global Insight and Policy and, and in close collaboration with the government of Finland really built um, and launched more recently a policy guidance on children and AI, building on the recognition that most solutions and AI is affecting children's lives across the board, um, not even solutions that they may be interacting with directly, and that most government policy, if at all, doesn't, doesn't sufficiently acknowledge the impact um, these may have on children and, you know, the opportunities that AI may hold um, for children and to improve children's lives. And so that framework you know, really aims to work directly with governments to uh, strengthen their policy frameworks and really um, also recognize the importance of engaging development um, and in solutions as they're designed designed and being built. And thirdly, you know, digital skills in general are really fundamental, of course, for children and young people as they're as they're growing. And you know, we see skills um, that needs to be provided to children and young people across the board. And it's it's a it's a real challenge, of course, as we're facing now only an increasing learning crisis for children around the world after COVID-19 um, to make sure that that full breadth of skills is being is being imparted um, for children Absolutely. and young people. Absolutely. Um, Sunita, and Sunita, thank you for that good work um, that UNICEF is doing in this innovation. We need those voices. And Rand and Viesa as well, thank you all for thinking hard about these challenges and also the potential that can be unlocked. Clearly, we all need to catch up with all of you. So thank you all uh, for that work and for being here with us today. It was a fantastic conversation. We just scratched the surface. Um, we'll have to continue it another time. Right now, though, I'll send it back over to Robbie Gramer. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to moderate our next session, um, which is all about diplomacy in the digital age. Um, back in the good old days, diplomacy was all about one thing, nations talking to nations. And obviously, that's no longer the case. Now we have countries around the world appointing their own ambassadors to big tech, ministries of defense and foreign affairs, boosting their in-house experts on, on cybersecurity and cyber policy, big tech companies becoming themselves as powerful in some senses, if not more than, than other countries around the world. Um, for this discussion, we've got a great panel here um, to discuss these matters, including uh, Martin Rockbauer, uh, the Austrian tech ambassador in Silicon Valley, Haley Tumerklar, ambassador at large for cybersecurity uh, for the country of Estonia, Joe White, the United Kingdom's tech envoy to the United States, and Yarmo Sareva, ambassador for cyber affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland. Um, as a reminder, we want to hear from you, the audience. Um, for those of you who are logged into our event website at foreignpolicy.com slash events, please remember to submit your questions via the question box to the right of the video player on your screen. We'll try to include as many audience questions as possible during the live session. And if you're joining us on social media, remember to chime in with your own thoughts and questions using the hashtag FPTechForum. Joe, I, I'd like to start with you on this matter. Um, how are countries connecting with big tech to use emerging technologies as a force for good? Um, and, you know, are there concerns in the conversations with, with big tech um, about things like disinformation, uh, cybersecurity? What are those conversations like when you're talking on behalf of a government to some of these powerful co companies? That's a great question. I mean, I think all of these issues are now uh, affect countries all over the world far more significantly than they ever had. And I think for a long time, tech got to play. It was this unequivocal good uh, uh, leading to positive changes in the Arab Spring and all these things that happened. And then it was started to be weaponized uh, uh, in terms of misinformation. And we've got to this area now where 
Uh, governments really need to take a role in engaging in that conversation. And I think tech has gone from this phase of playing almost regulatory whack-a-mole, saying, well, we can't do that, that's a bad idea, or we can't do that, that's a bad idea. And I think the conversation has reached a point now where uh, tech realizes they have to engage in these things. Government realizes they have to upskill themselves. There's an information and expertise asymmetry often in these conversations. And so uh, uh, big tech needs to open up more with what's happening on the inside and government needs to have the expertise to engage in those conversations. But they're, they're, they're never easy. I mean, these are things which will often end up with some uh, commercial constraint uh, coming in or there are trade-offs on these issues. But I think it's important for democratically elected uh, governments to have officials that can engage in those conversations and move it forward. Mm -hmm. And and Martin, how are those conversations going from from your vantage point? Do you feel that that tech companies are are have a growing realization or understanding that they have, you know, their work, their policies have national security implications here? Um, and what are your conversations like with these companies? Well, that's that's a great question. I think uh, one of the things we realized very early when we started with our tech diplomacy efforts was that not all tech companies are the same. We have in here in Silicon Valley where we are based, uh, we have small startups that uh, you know come here uh, to scale up. Uh, we have medium sized companies, and we have the big uh, global uh, tech companies that have often very very different agendas, very different needs, and and they are very often at different stages in their development. And of course, yeah, if we talk to the big uh, global digital platforms uh, that operate uh, in, in many countries around the world, they are very well aware of the implications uh, their own uh, policies have. Sometimes it is them who make us realize in those conversations, you know, that some of the policy initiatives uh, we are contemplating, that they sometimes have unintended consequences elsewhere in the world, which is a very interesting uh, aspect. And then, of course, we also uh, have conversations with uh, smaller companies um, and make them aware of what is going on in multilateral diplomacies, the kind of norms and values that are being formed um, in other places in the world. And they are very, very grateful uh, for that to have this direct uh, access. And of course, also for us internally, um, uh, you know, tech diplomacy is also, as, as Joe said, it's also a learning experience for us as diplomats. So uh, for us, we also need to engage in an internal coordination effort that is much better than what we used to do. We need to talk about the things going on here, uh, to talk with our colleagues in New York, uh, in Geneva, in Brussels, of course, um, and, and Vienna, uh, in order to, you know, coordinate better. We have often, as diplomats, very uh, siloed uh, information. Uh, about a specific uh, uh, problem or issue that we tackle, uh, but then we don't really have the full picture. Yeah, yeah. And Haley, I'd, I'd like to turn to you briefly. Obviously, um, Estonia is is no stranger to the to cybersecurity threats, um, given given one of your neighbors here. Um, and and Estonia is seen in, in Europe as one of the most cybersecurity aware or savvy countries. I'm just wondering if you could talk about how um, your conversations go with with government and with private sector to try to increase cybersecurity resilience when it comes to potential cybersecurity threats, bad actors, um, geopolitical tensions that that uh, that erupt in in the cyber realm, and and if those conversations with with tech companies are are cooperative, if if there's any tension, or or if everyone seems to be on the same team, that there's that there's shared issues here that we need to tackle together. Um, thank you, Robbie, for this great question. So, I think all the governments by now have realized that um, uh, the cyber diplomacy or tech diplomacy is certainly uh, a new field where it's not only the governments that uh, are playing here, but it's mostly the private sector and um, different companies. And when we talk about cybersecurity specifically, then um, uh, certainly all the um, national cyber experts and decision makers on national level, they are working closely together with their own uh, national counterparts, uh, uh, which are private sector companies running critical infrastructure. Because what we see now is the increasing risk to the critical services and critical infrastructure from different uh, systemic risks like ransomware, also the state-sponsored or state-organized attacks. And the governments uh, have a um, quite uh, good uh, track record of close cooperation and close public-private partnership on national level for, on cybersecurity. 
So um, uh, as it comes to the multinational um, framework, then we are certainly uh, now increasingly looking towards the solutions that the tech companies could provide in uh, making uh, sure that um, the software and hardware that we are using would be more secure. So we talk about security by design principles, for instance. We talk about the um, uh, notifications on zero-day exploits and vulnerabilities in the software. Uh, we know that um, majority of the serious attacks and incidents in, in the last 10-15 years are um, coming from the exploitation of um, the loopholes in software. And uh, uh, the notorious uh, ransomware attacks, WannaCry and NotPetya in 2017, maybe being uh, um, the most um, uh, serious ones and having uh, serious economic consequences, not just um, for the IT sector, but um, uh, different economic sectors globally. So one quarter of the uh, shipping industry was down for the week uh, in 2017 because of the major ransomware incident. So therefore, uh, we certainly realized that um, continue, continuous dialogue is necessary with the big tech that is pro providing us the domain, uh, the cyber domain, and um, is taking care of the innovation and research in this field uh, so that the uh, security features would be already uh, integrated into the products that we see in the markets. And it's also applying to IoT products, for instance. Uh, we can uh, foresee there's a scenario when um, all the coffee machines and fridges will be uh, connected to the internet in the future. So we might have coffee machine army and the fridge army suddenly. So we don't want to see the coffee machines <laughs> attacking fridges. So it's better if we have um, security by design integrated into those IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no one no one wants to uh, to put at risk our strategic coffee supplies. So, so these are really important issues to go through. Just, just to quickly build on that point, if, if that's all right, I, I think yeah. the point about cultural change in software engineering processes there where it, you know, it's evolved from building stuff to building stuff and having automated bug testing in there to building stuff now to have automated security testing in there. And these are the pieces which need to change culturally in, in big tech. And one piece I heard the other day uh, from one of the uh, 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 leaders of software within Salesforce was about building some of these um, democratic or bias-based security or safety features as part of their engineering process. So you have the bug bit where you remove the bugs, you have the security bits where you plug the holes, and then you have the unexpected consequences of bias bits, which is then a, a, a testing and analysis framework before the code actually goes live. So I think these are the things we need to start to factor into how we consider building software, both security, safety, and of course, functionally. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I'd, I'd like to dive a bit more into that. First, Yarmo, I, I, I did want to go to you. I mean, you know, during the, the pandemic era, when when everyone's interactions have basically been over, over Zoom, we've seen the true impact of living in a mostly digital world. So I'm just wondering what, what are some lessons that, that from your perspective, where governments are are trying to learn, trying to incorporate into their planning to ensure that that tech is used in a more beneficial way here. Well, um, the first uh, first lesson uh, really is that uh, uh, during the pandemic and the leap that we all took, the uh, digital divide uh, actually became uh, wider than uh, pre-pandemic. What I'm, I'm referring to is the uh, divide between the, uh, the uh, first world and the uh, developing world, but also the divides uh, uh, within societies um, between, uh, in many countries, between uh, men and women and uh, between the um, uh, well-off and the uh, disadvantaged. So we need to make sure that um, um, from here on, uh, governments, um, and uh, uh, global organizations or the European Union for that matter, uh, which uh, feels a lot of uh, um, clout uh, in the development field, uh, make sure that uh, we, um, we embark on a path to narrow these uh, digital uh, divides. Uh, that's, that's really essential. And of course, um, another lesson is that uh, uh, the, uh, the leap that we took and the dependence on uh, uh, digital uh, communications um, uh, 
puts um, an ever greater need for, uh, for digital trust and security. Um, but in, in a more general way, um, if we are to reach uh, the sustainable development goals and to make life better for everybody globally, um, we, uh, we cannot reach those goals uh, without the digital tools and uh, emerging technologies. And for that to happen, um, the digital uh, space uh, must be uh, safe and, and secure and, of course, open and free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so we're starting to get some audience questions uh, coming in. I'd, I'd like to start with uh, Eugenio, who's a, who's a tech diplomat with the Brazilian consulate in San Francisco. He asked, um, and this is a question, it, it seems, for Martin and Joe. Um, Martin, I'll start with you. Um, for governments willing to strengthen their tech policy dialogue with, with big tech companies in Silicon Valley and beyond, what advice would you give to them? That's a, that's a great question. I think... Uh, what you need to uh, do is that you uh, strengthen, uh, first of all, uh, your internal um, coordination efforts that you, in some ways, uh, talk to uh, civil society, uh, that you uh, also uh, look at the different uh, areas uh, of your foreign policy that is affected by digitalization uh, that can uh, range from the geopolitical uh, aspects of uh, digitalization uh, to the human rights aspects of digitalization uh, to the actual uh, digital tools that you uh, employ um, as uh, diplomats, uh, you know, in dialogue with your citizens. And uh, then you uh, f- formulate uh, your, your concrete goals and your strategies. And in the case of tech diplomacy here in Silicon Valley, I think uh, what we really do is trying to get a private sector a perspective uh, to uh, back and feed them into our government structures, as well as getting um, uh, our citizens' concerns and our citizens' uh, values and interests uh, and get and, and bring them into the uh, dialogue with private sector companies. Mm-hmm. And, J- and Joe, any, uh, any other advice beyond, uh, yeah, beyond I, what Martin shared? No, I, I, I would agree with, with what Martin said, lining things up. The, the piece that then I think is, is really required on governments is to upskill uh, themselves internally, as in the, 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 the policy officials that are going to be engaging with big tech and this is where uh, big tech can often have uh, folks from government turn up and want to talk to them about their tech, which, which they broadly don't necessarily understand. And so I think having technical experts inside government who can support those conversations. Uh, I mean, I've come into this post from 20 years in the private sector as an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. And I think being able to engage in a conversation which can provide that translation layer for big tech through the policy world and have those technical conversations which are not... Um, embarrassing questions about uh, how email works, uh, which you occasionally see in some political forums. But so upskilling on the government side is crucial for these conversations to be meaningful for big tech and to not just appear as, uh, as frustrations. Yeah, yeah. And um, we've, we've, that, that's a great point. And, and I'd love to hear uh, Helene Yarma's perspectives on that. I'm also going to fold in one more question. This is from Cole Allen um, at the Cyber Governance and Policy Center at the University of Oklahoma. Um, we've heard a lot about the private tech sector adopting international norms. What are the risks and rewards of these companies starting to set new norms within the evolving cyber environment? Um, and so that sounds like a question that drives to the heart of who should be in the driver's seat here on setting international cyber norms, government or private sector? And uh, Heli, I'd, I'd like to start with you on, on that. Well, I have uh, spent the last 15 years um, trying to make sure that the governments uh, have the norms and follow the norms. So uh, it's not easy, I can tell you. So we have been um, uh, uh, agreeing in the United Nations now in 2021 that, yes, we have the norms, we implement the norms and we follow international law as government. So it has taken roughly um, more than 10 years to come to this uh, conclusion that all 193 governments now have signed up to this. We call it a normative framework or a re- framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And um, uh, I think, uh, well, uh, there, there will be many books and articles about how this all happened uh, when I will retire. But um, uh, so far, I can say that it's been uh, quite difficult uh, to arrive to a point that all the uh, major powers are agreeing on certain set of rules uh, and co- that would constrain their behavior. 
So if you look at the um, role of the private sector, of course, we, the governments, rely on advice uh, that private sector can offer or expertise that private sector can offer. But when it comes to the issues of war and peace, I guess these are the uh, usual territories <laughs> of governments. And as um, I uh, always um, uh, promote the multi-stakeholder engagement and the dialogue with the private sector, I think um, we uh, certainly continue this dialogue um, also in this international security field, uh, but um, we also keep some of those uh, conversations between the governments only. And this is how, how it is in all other fields of international security. When we discuss nuclear disarmament, it's the same. When we does, discuss uh, conventional disarmament, it's the same. So we do also uh, this in the um, cyber uh, um, behavior discussions. And I think I very much like the point that Joe made about translation and, and how we, the tech diplomats, need to be translators um, between the uh, big tech and our government's concerns. It is true that um, those uh, um, are very different worlds. And, and I think we need more upscaling, as you said, of um, the government officials very fast on the tech issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Yarma, just, just to get back to Cole's question here, I mean, do you see a, do you see a trend of, of tech companies, you know, in a way setting international norms in a way where the government is governments are slow to catch up? Is there any inherent risks or danger there? Or or do you think it's it's pretty set that, that governments are in the driver's seat now? Well, uh, first of all, um, Hedy, Hedy uh, hit the nail in the head in, in so many ways. Um, and um, Finland very much shares the same uh, approach where you know, we see a you know, multi-stakeholder uh, ship um, as, as being natural. So for us, it's not an either or uh, question, it's both. But um, I, I'd like to stress that uh, we need uh, not only governments and uh, the private sector, but also uh, the academia and civil society in this conversation. And I'll call kind of a, a quadruple uh, helix uh, uh, model here. Um, I, would, I would agree, uh, however, with Heli that when it comes to uh, the issues of uh, uh, national security and uh, national interest, um, it should be the governments that uh, write uh, the norms. Um, in general, uh, as we have seen in so many ways uh, um, in recent time and before, uh, there's a limit to uh, what uh, the private sector uh, can do through self-regulation. So um, uh, governments must uh, engage with the private sector in a spirit of multi-stakeholdership, but at the same time uh, make sure that uh, the great power that the big tech uh, wields um, is uh, wielded uh, responsibly because uh, with great power comes great uh, responsibility. And as we have seen, big tech hasn't always used it uh, um, in, a, in a responsible uh, way. Uh, one, one more uh, point, um, it's about the translation thing. Um, I think we all um, are grappling with the same challenge, which is the uh, you know, siloed uh, landscape uh, in our governments. Um, and uh, uh, for this reason, it is indeed uh, uh, extremely important to translate the uh, tech agenda um, to uh, the political uh, decision makers. Um, one final point. Uh, and this is about the you know the great power and great great responsibility thing. In a way, we have moved away from the uh, Westphalian uh, world. Um, governments have outsourced a lot of uh, 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 formerly state uh, functions to the private sector, and in many ways it does work, but in in some ways it doesn't. And what we are seeing um, is um, kind of the end of. Uh, uh, globalization 1.0, or maybe even end of globalization 2.0, and uh, kind of uh, um, uh, return of the state in in China, um, in the U.S., and uh, and and also in uh, in Europe. Um, and we need to make sure that the uh, pendulum, which is now swinging swinging back, doesn't swing uh, too far back. And therefore, we need uh, multi-stakeholder uh, approaches. Um, with um, with values uh, at heart, you know, liberal, 
uh, open society values uh, um, and uh, governments need to make sure that uh, uh, that uh, the private sector adheres to and supports these values. Yeah, and that actually dovetails greatly with another audience question um, from Sanita Sandir in with Mission Victory India, um, watching from India. Um, Sanita asks, uh, what's the experience uh, from, from your perspective with company executives when it comes to their interest in uh, business interests, profits versus their personal sense of, of nationality here? What are the unique challenges of interacting with the private sector here versus diplomacy, which, which gets to the heart of, you know, are companies with this great power actually stepping up to act with great responsibility? Or is that still a difficult conversation that, that you're all having with, with tech companies to, to step up and think of the greater good, even if it might impact the profit margins? Uh, opening up for for anyone who has thoughts on that, Martin. It looks like you've you've got some thoughts to start. I think this really goes to the heart of the question. Uh, you know, ultimately, governments, uh, at least democratically elected governments, are beholden to their citizens, uh, and and uh, companies are beholden to their shareholders. And uh, of course, um, many companies uh, with whom we have conversations, they have a, a company. Uh, values and company culture and and they say the right things and they think that you know they have the right beliefs but ultimately i mean they also have to look at the bottom line and at uh, their profits and in those kind of uh, conversations uh, that we have with the companies uh, they they also show us you know that the kind of decisions companies need to make are not always easy they're they're conundrums that they're often in uh, and it's not always uh, so easy you know as a as a uh, a company uh, if you you know operate uh, in a, in a country um, that does not have uh, uh, democratic values, what do you do? Do you just withdraw? Uh, do you uh, and, and so sometimes these kind of dialogues are not so much that government versus uh, private companies, but kind of how can we help each other in order to uh, up uh, to keep up our democratic values? Another point of the problem is also that governments themselves and our democratic institutions are increasingly um, held in the digital space uh, in, in, in social media and, and in, can in some ways be influenced. The kind of things we agree upon as a society are determined in the digital space. So that's another problem uh, where companies have a huge responsibility, sometimes a responsibility they are increasingly shying away uh, to, to take uh, because of the kind of conundrums uh, they are facing there as well. And uh, Joe, um, did, did you have any thoughts on, on this as well? Yes, uh, yeah, I did. I mean, I, I think this is this is a key, a key point, as Martin says, within it. And part of this goes to the um, information and expertise asymmetry. I, I heard a, a good comment from a, a commentator on the other day about, um, did you get sick drinking your milk this morning? Uh, and, and he said, well, of course not. And why not? Because milk is regulated. It's, it's obviously cheaper to produce milk without any standards. But actually, we do this such that you don't do that. The challenge with some of the impacts of tech, whether it's the sickness creeping into democracy or even the mental health issues is they're slow moving and hard to piece. That's why the parallels with the cigarette companies about what data did they know beforehand? You know, cancer obviously takes a long time to develop through smoking. Hard to know this over many years. Does mental health take a while to develop through these processes? And, and so, so this information asymmetry, which in the release of things like uh, the Facebook papers, Facebook saying, well, these misrepresent and our data doesn't show this. And it's hard to say without the full data set. I think only the tech companies have this full data set. And so actually we need to be able to provide this in a way which can be assessed almost from a public health, democratic health, societal benefit perspective, and then work these things out. It's not that we need to vilify tech for the things they're doing. Many of these things are externalities. And um, the, the challenge is how do we pick through this data collectively to figure out what the right thing for all of us is. And it will probably lead to an area which is which is more regulated and government has to have the access to information and expertise to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, unfortunately, we uh, we have to wrap up now. Um, but thank you to all of you for the such a fascinating conversation on some of those uh, big existential issues in the world of diplomacy, national security and, and tech today. Um, up next, um, uh, we've got a finale for our program, two more great sessions to explore how technology can be harnessed as a driver for sustainable and equitable development, um, what it'll take to achieve tech-driven growth around the world. And here to moderate those sessions is Amelia Lester, who's executive editor of Foreign Policy. Hello, Amelia. I'll let you take it from here. 
Hi, Robbie. Thanks for that. I'm delighted to take us into the final stretch of today's program. Uh, as you just shared, Robbie, we have two more really interesting perspectives coming up on the topic of driving digital development and growth. And first, I'm delighted to welcome to the virtual stage Her Excellency Dr. Armani Abu Zaid, who is the Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy at the African Union Commission. Let me quickly just go through a bit about Dr. Abu Zaid's bio. She's the twice elected African Union Commissioner in charge of infrastructure, energy, and ICT. She has served in many leadership positions in international organizations and has implemented national and continental multi-sectoral developmental programs, including the world's largest solar power plant. She launched the single African air transport market, African single energy market, first African digital de- transformation strategy, as well as a 10-year program for infrastructure development in Africa. So she's, prom- she's been promoting these major continental initiatives for African integration under the African Union Agenda 2063. Welcome to the program, Commissioner. Hello, Amelia, and allow me at the, uh, uh, at the beginning to thank you, to thank Foreign Policy for inviting me to uh, this very uh, important, interesting forum. I have been uh, pinned to my screen uh, since uh, for a few hours now, looking into and following the uh, very interesting conversations and the distinguished panelists, uh, panelists on this in this forum. Uh, really fantastic. Well, that, let's begin then by asking, what do people miss or fail to understand about the issue of digitization in Africa? Ah, that's a, that's a, a very interesting uh, question to start our conversation. Um, digital or digitalization is, um, by nature, is a game changer. And for us, particularly in Africa, is a game changer for the African continent. Um, it is our opportunity to boost economic growth, industrialization, alleviate poverty, improve people's lives. And it is very much in line with the, uh, with, with the African Union Agenda 2063. And here I remind everyone that Agenda 2063 is, uh, or the African Union is this political body that is, uh, that, you know, groups all African nations, 55 of them, and with a common goal of a, of a united Africa with a single development agenda uh, or strategies agenda 2063. Now, what people miss is that uh, the importance of digital economy in Africa. Uh, digital economy already contributes about 10% of African GDP. Uh, uh, we have about 300, more than 300,000 direct jobs uh, uh, in mobile technology and more than 2 million jobs in uh, a related, uh, 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 a related to, to mobile technology or, or digital technology across the continent. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, uh, it, the fastest uh, uh, penetrating, I mean, the, inter- the internet in Africa is the fastest penetrating uh, in the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's 10 times uh, uh, faster maybe than other parts uh, of the world. And um, we have 480 million mobile money accounts in, in, in Africa. That is more than all developing regions combined. Uh, Africa also has 640 tech hubs, uh, which are active across uh, uh, the continent. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, what people... Um, what people seem to miss is that uh, Africa is not sitting still. Africa is making giant leaps when it comes to digitalization. And Africa is already seeing the great potential and opportunity this technology is offering us in terms of uh, developing, um, uh, uh, developing solutions to adapt it to our context and to our problems. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the mobile money. Let us just remind everybody that mobile money was invented by Africans in Africa. Uh, uh, and that SMS, even before that, was also inv- invented in Africa. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to also, when we talk about Africa, to take that into consideration, recognizing, of course, that there are still um, uh, um, serious uh, problems of connectivity uh, because only uh, about 40 percent 
uh, of the population is connected to the internet. We still have a divide in terms of not only gender, but also urban rural. Uh, it's still expensive uh, in some parts of the continent. Uh, it's sometimes 10 times more expensive than other parts of the world. So there are still very serious uh, challenges, uh, Got it. but also fantastic opportunities. Yeah, thank you so much for that important scene setting. I do think that often that kind of more dynamic, positive side of things is missed. So I'm really glad that we've started the conversation out providing that context. I'm really curious to hear from you about the connection and opportunities that you see between digitization and energy opportunities, in particular building a green recovery from the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about the connections between energy and digital technologies in Africa? Uh, yes, I can talk to that, but I will, I will talk first about recovery or about, or about the pandemic itself. Uh, because despite the tragedies and the serious crisis, of course, that uh, uh, the pandemic brought up to, brought to the to the world and and to us in Africa for the first time, we're seeing you know uh, a slowing down in terms of growth. Uh, first time in twenty or twenty five years, the pandemic is or became the single biggest uh, catalyst for digitalization in Africa. So it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible how within a few weeks, a month, uh, 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 digital solutions were, you know, mushrooming across the continent in every sector, of course, starting with health. Can you give uh, some uh, examples of those? Oh, of course. I mean, whether it's, uh, uh, of course, you know, the trackers, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the health apps, you know, to notify the population or to register, or to attract, you know, the, those who are not well or to give advice. Uh, and almost in all countries, um, and later on, of course, the, the digital tools uh, uh, to, I mean, for vaccination, uh, uh, whether it's, you know, in terms of uh, 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 finance, uh, uh, suddenly, uh, and I'm saying suddenly because it was not the case everywhere, uh, suddenly now, uh, um, Apps are being used by by central banks and by governments to uh, uh, to provide services for the informal sector. So I talked about financial inclusion because people needed support, you know, for to uh, um, uh, to support them during those uh, harsh times in which you know their livelihoods were interrupted. So uh, cash transfers were uh, were um, made through uh, uh, um, uh, um, tech apps. Uh, uh, we, we, we've seen also uh, drones uh, uh, delivering uh, uh, um, uh, medication in some parts of the continent. It's incredible. So, and, and moreover, uh, uh, and this, is, this continues as, as we speak, all, everything that is particularly related to eGov is, uh, 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 has seen a huge boost almost in all countries. And the second is e-commerce. Whether you want to buy a, a, a pack of, uh, uh, a box of tea, or uh, you want to buy a car, <laughs> you can do that now uh, through uh, the multitude of platforms uh, everywhere uh, in the content from micro enterprises to, to the big enterprises. Having said that, of course, not we have to remind ourselves that 65% of the economy of this continent is informal and that, um, that not all enterprises or businesses have access to internet, uh, maybe only 25%, but the growth in terms of growth, it's amazing. So that's um, fascinating. Just on amazing. that issue of, of the innovations that you've outlined that came as a result of the pandemic, I guess we also need to talk alongside that with the fact that the pandemic did expose a growing digital divide in terms of access. I think I've read that only about one third of Africans have access to broadband. Obviously, as these innovations continue and accelerate, that issue is going to become more acute. Can you talk about some ways in which investments need to be made to ensure that individuals and businesses and governments can get online in the next decade? Uh, absolutely. Uh, 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 th that is why already since 2019, uh, in partnership with the European Union, with the World Bank and other partners, 
and together with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, we developed a, a digital transformation uh, strategy for the continent, uh, not to have these patchy uh, uh, or uh, uh, examples or these um, anecdotal examples. We wanted, you know, transformation to happen uh, uh, throughout the continent and to move together, even though we are not necessarily all at the same uh, level of development when it comes to digitalization, but at least we move together towards a common goal. So uh, it so happened that last year, uh, January 2020, the heads of states and governments adopted this strategy. And two and three months later, you know, the, the, the COVID erupted. So again, talk about, uh, talk about you know, a good uh, timing, because now what we are doing is that also in the we have a program for infrastructure development in Africa. And I'm talking here about uh, the major infrastructure programs that link to a region of the continent or uh, that links uh, uh, throughout, I mean, that goes throughout the continent, transcontinental. Uh, and it was also the time when we were preparing those uh, priority projects. 25% uh, of these projects are uh, for uh, productivity, ICT productivity, exactly talking to the point that you are saying. So we have those now ready, packed, um, prepared, they are bankable, they are agreed upon, they are consulted upon, um, uh, and we want to accelerate, you know, the implementation of those uh, projects. Uh, also, uh, the same, uh, in the same vein, uh, accelerating, you know, uh, the, the programs for training or for skills enhancement, uh, especially for girls and women, again, to, uh, uh, to talk to uh, the divide. In the infrastructure projects that we, uh, that we prioritized, they are also linking urban and rural, because we are very much um, concerned uh, that of that serious divide in Africa between urban and rural. It's not the same at all, maybe in other parts of the world, but for us, it's a serious, it's a serious issue. Uh, um, uh, and and then there's also the uh, uh, regulations and the policies. Uh, the aim here is to um, harmonize the regulations and policies across the continent to create an economy of scale, to entice investors, you know, to have a larger market. They often call it, you know, the invisible mile. You know, th this is not what people see, but it's highly important. Uh, so, uh, 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 and, and then this year we are focusing on things like a policy, a data policy uh, a framework for the continent. I don't need to dwell on how important uh, data is important is is for the digital uh, economy and also digital ID. I'm not uh, going to shock you, but half of half of Africa does not have uh, any form of identification. Um. I have a couple of interesting audience questions that build off this discussion. Um, the first is from Stephen in New York, who writes, can you talk a little bit about China's role in these infrastructure projects that we've been talking about and that are in a number of African countries? Is the dispute between the US and China hampering these efforts, especially in relation to 5G build-outs and Huawei equipment? Uh, uh, maybe, but uh, again, we are not talking, he, maybe he or she is talking about the national level, uh, uh, which we do not cater for at the African Union, but African Union, as I said, is regional and transcontinental programs, and these are multi, uh, uh, multi partners, uh, no single partner, and uh, less Chinese than others, and we also have the African Development Bank. Uh, which is very active in regional uh, infrastructure. But again, I do, I'm, not, uh, I'm not dodging the question or anything, but I would like to refocus it uh, because um, uh, uh, Chinese infrastructure or the share of Chinese infrastructure uh, uh, in Africa is only 20%. Uh, 80% is non-Chinese. Non so uh, I, 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 again, I'm not into, or we should not in, go into, you know, um, how would I say, um, we have to see the whole picture, not just part of it. Uh, 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 and Africa is open for business and, and works for it, everybody with all partners. Uh, but I want to go back to the question about energy. If 
the um, I have one more question and then we'll go back to the energy question if that's okay. I just want to address these audience sure. questions. This is from Sanidya Sandhya in India. Um, he writes, with a focus on COVID, the Indian government open sourced their vaccination software and offered consultations to several, several African countries. Can such open sourced governance software provide a model for sustained and scaled up cooperation between governments and private players? It should. I mean, again, it's not just because of COVID. Of course, COVID uh, allowed for uh, or ex accelerated certain things, but definitely we, we I mean, the, I, what, uh, another, another positive impact of COVID is that we, we all understand how much we are uh, interlinked and connected and that no one can do it by their own, on their own, and that we have to work uh, together in order, you know, to face a common uh, problem, and this time is a serious, serious problem. So um, it's not just about India or not just about open source. I think, I mean, in when it comes to development, when it comes going forward, particularly in that space, in that digital space, uh, 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 because it knows no physical borders or frontiers. Uh, we do have to uh, definitely work together and partnership is, is highly valued in that space. Okay, great. Well, unfortunately, that's about all we have time for today. Um, thank you so much, Doctor, for your expertise and for your context. And we're now moving on to our final speaker of the day, who is Rodrigo Janez Benitez, who is the Vice Minister of Trade for Chile. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here live, but we were able to virtually meet a few days ago, and we talked about Chile's efforts and objectives in joining the DEPA, a first-of-its-kind Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, which was launched between Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore recently to help small economies take advantage of the digital marketplace and create opportunities of inclusion. So I started our conversation by asking a question I was curious about, which is that this Digital Economy Partnership Agreement was created due to the common interest between Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore to take advantage of the digital marketplace to benefit small countries. So how does the cost benefit analysis on tech, how is that different for small economies? In terms of the opportunities uh, for us, we are convinced that the future of trade is or will be around services and digital economy. So that is why for us this is pretty much purely gain. And in the context of the pandemic, we have seen an exponential and explosive actually growth of e-commerce, but also we have seen that services uh, that we're lagging behind in terms of how much we need them to be present in our export portfolio. We have many different extractive uh, or natural resources industries around which many high tech services, uh, high value uh, services have been developed, which turned into uh, either a digital good or a service that could benefit uh, from the rules established in DEPA. So um, this dig digitalization that we have witnessed uh, for us uh, is uh, allowing uh, and seeing, uh, you know, services to be delivered digitally uh, in ways that we have never seen and in weeks happened what we expected to happen in years. So with people also now uh, demanding more digital entertainment, um, like streaming platforms, video games, and uh, like you can see the trade becoming one of the sectors that has been growing faster in our economies, uh, we are convinced that for a small economy like ours, but also coming from a group that has a story behind, uh, each, uh, behind it, which is the P4. Uh, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, and Chile uh, are part from that of that from of that group from long ago, and that group has delivered ha high impact and large scale initiatives. Uh, like at the end of the day, the CPTPP, for instance, has become the DEPA is something no different, and um, we expect that uh, this also set an important milestone in the rule setting of the digital economy. But in the terms of the post-recovery, also as a way of including more people into the global economy. The barriers uh, to participate are now diminished. 
and in comparison uh, to the brick and mortar economy, so uh, more people can now take part of the global trade and that has been at the very center of the decision on why we decided to kick off this process precisely here in Chile, in Viña del Mar, in uh, the context of our APEC host here. The main objective of the agreement is to establish certain basic rules to promote the three countries as digital economy platforms. Can you talk us through what are some of those rules or pillars on which the agreement is built? Well, first, the spirit uh, and the, the base uh, under which, uh, or from which we started to work was uh, the obstacles for accessing digital commerce and uh, also the gaps that we have in connectivity. Uh, we have seen that across the world, millions of people are unable to access the internet and to participate online, and also that women are disproportionately excluded. And this is something that also has an important focus in DIPA. So there are many factors that contribute to this, and like unaffordable devices, um, data tariffs, tariffs uh, inequalities in education and digital skills, and like I mentioned, in the case of women, some social norms persist around the globe that discourage them from being online. And fears about privacy, safety, security uh, are also part of the problems that people face. To overcome these issues, uh, and now going to the rule setting part, DIPA includes provisions that aim at including traditionally excluded segments of the population, like young people, women, indigenous people, and mismis but also provisions that create a secure and trustworthy environment for users and enterprises uh, to participate in the digital economy by making sure that consumers are protected, that financial information is secure, and that cybersecurity issues are also uh, addressed. You mentioned the role of the private sector. I'm curious, what is the role of companies in ensuring a level playing field for international trade, and what are the limits of government in doing this? What we have seen uh, based on the interaction that we have had uh, with the private sector is um, that uh, there is a need uh, for rules, for uh, certainty uh, when it comes to LinkedIn, when we talk about large corporations linked to investment. Um, in the case of Chile, uh, we want, uh, we are working very hard to position ourselves as the region, uh, the Latin American or the South American region have a digital hub. And we are doing a lot of work around infrastructure, such as the deployment of the 5G network or the construction of uh, the Trans-Pacific Digital uh, the Fiber Optics Cable that will link New Zealand and Australia with Chile and from there to uh, the rest of the Asia Pacific. That infrastructure, for instance, and, and can, cannot come without rules. That, so that is why the DIPA is a key piece to give certainty to the economic uh, players um, to make investments uh, based on, on the rule setting that we are working. And we think that he, being this agreement, the first of its kind in the world, um, uh, it has been extremely well received by large players. But also, uh, like we were talking before, this will be extremely important uh, when it comes to the to the small uh, and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, and that is why we pushed so hard to give a structured uh, um, a dialogue, but also provisions uh, around SMEs in this chapter. And we believe that they will be extremely important uh, partners of large uh, IT companies, which, ha which are, are, are looking at DIPA as an example to follow. How do you see the DIPA evolving in the future? China, South Korea and Canada have all expressed interest in joining. Let's take South Korea and Canada first. What do you see as how the conversation with South Korea and Canada evolves or progresses? What do they need to do in order to sign on to the DIPA? First of all, uh, the, each country has to present, you know, a project uh, of cooperation uh, to put, you know, as part of uh, its contribution to this community. And this is something that has been, you know, more advanced in the case of Canada and uh, South Korea. With them also, we have had uh, several months of technical interaction between uh, our teams and we welcome uh, certainly that interest. So for us, it's very important to gain momentum and strategic weight um, 
when making these rules. Um, because we believe this will be the standard of digital trade. And uh, as we will do with other countries uh, during the process, with any other countries, excuse me, with, uh, during the process of accession, um, we will support the intentions and fairly assess the application of all interested parties during the whole process. So uh, it's important that candidates can comply with the standards of the agreement, uh, since uh, still a renegotiating process is not considered. But the idea behind is to continue being a forward-looking agreement that can attract partners that can commit on the disciplines, including in DIPA. This will serve to keep the internet as a global, competitive and open platform uh, for innovation and creativity. And what about China? China is not a small economy. How does Chile see China's role in the DIPA? Well, we have seen the interest of China in the CPTPP, for instance, uh, also, and, uh, and their, their uh, intention to uh, uh, make the regulatory changes that could make them uh, meet the standards that, of that agreement. And in this case, it's, it's not different. Uh, we welcome the, and we support the interest uh, of China uh, to be part of the DIPA. But now what comes is a technical uh, process, an interaction process, uh, um, a mutual feedback in terms of how, uh, in this case, China um, intends to uh, fulfill the uh, commitment of the stand, uh, the compliance of the standards of the agreement, along with this other uh, cooperation project that I mentioned, where China has a lot, I think, uh, to offer. Uh, so I think here the, the rule is, is, is fair and equal for any interested party and that rule is pretty much the standards that the agreement provides for. And what we expect is to engage with China in that technical work to get, uh, you know, that feedback uh, in, as part of this uh, accession process. Let's step back from the deeper. I'd like to talk about what Chile is doing to ensure opportunities of inclusion to bring in more women and SMEs into the global economy. Well, coming from DIPA, uh, like, like I mentioned, we are really looking forward to implement this SME uh, module uh, uh, to take advantage of uh, the digital transformation as a fundamental instrument for economic uh, reactivation. Um, this agreement promotes sectors uh, like creative industries and e-commerce, which have played a fundamental role during the social distancing, uh, making it a priority uh, to develop initiatives that can favor their development uh, to accelerate recovery. So uh, this digitalization uh, of uh, SMEs is extremely important. And as part of that, we have a working group with the Ministry of Economy that is uh, pushing uh, uh, very hard for, uh, to expedite and scale up uh, the digitalization of, uh, of SMEs as a main barrier uh, uh, for uh, getting them online. And uh, also from the Ministry of Women, uh, we are uh, incorporating them uh, to develop also this export women program that our trade promotion agency has, which is called uh, um, mujer exporta or uh, exporter women. Um, we, we, we think that uh, these enabling conditions need to be addressed uh, at the you know at the more broader level as a public policy that does not come only from trade or the ministry or, or foreign affairs, but as a as a larger effort, a countrywide public private nation effort. Because um, what we have seen uh, in this pandemic is that this will be the, um, the, 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 the playground of the future. And if we don't, if we're not able to scale up um, the conditions for SMEs and companies to, to go abroad uh, uh, in the digital uh, sphere, then we will be uh, extremely unsuccessful in this endeavor. So. This is an effort that from Chile is incorporating not just foreign affairs, but also economy, the finance minister, the Ministry of Women, um, and uh, some other agencies that uh, are, have tailored programs to scale up the first, the digitalization of SMEs, uh, second, the internal, internationalization of SMEs, um, and then uh, that is why uh, we are working on a nation uh, strategy uh, or national strategy for uh, export in services. 
um, which will touch on all of these issues and will facilitate uh, our uh, companies to go abroad with a gender also aspect um, that, uh, like I mentioned, for us, it's something that it's not just a matter of principles, but also it's good business. Finally, how can digital trade be leveraged by the international community to support growth access across the developing world? What does the international community need to do to ensure this happens? From a general perspective, we think uh, the, 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 the that the key point is leading by example. Um, if we are deemed a success story, uh, more developing countries will see interest in this process that uh, we have been doing with our digital trade policy. And there are some players in the international arena that believe that the digital economy could lower the tax revenues affecting especially the developing countries. On the other side, uh, Antilla being also a developing economy, we estimate that the digital economy is an opportunity for our SMEs to grow and to access new markets, bringing benefits to our citizens. But uh, in the multilateral uh, arena, uh, we are looking with a very close eye also the negotiations on e-commerce, on the joint statement uh, initiative on e-commerce, which has gathered a large uh, uh, membership uh, or men, uh, WTO members uh, under it. And so where we're preparing and doing also the political push towards the MC12 that will take place in a few weeks time, uh, uh, hoping that we can uh, really push for uh, uh, an expedited advance on, on that end. We think DIPA has a higher level of ambition, but nevertheless, you know, uh, uh, as, as, as it includes a broader set uh, of, uh, of uh, members, it's an extremely important uh, negotiation uh, as well uh, to follow and support. Vice Minister of Trade for Chile, Rodrigo Janez, thank you so much for your insights and time. Thank you very much to you all and have a very good day. Rodrigo Janez Benitez, who is Vice Minister of Trade for Chile and past me, closing out today's program. It will be fascinating to continue watching the truly transformational impacts of all these new technologies, what they will do to the world economy, geopolitics, and how government and industry are going to behave and address opportunities and challenges over the coming years. FP will, of course, keep a clo close eye on these trends, so stay tuned for more coverage and the excellent research coming from our FP analytics team as well. A big thank you to all of our speakers who have joined us for this inaugural FP Tech Forum and helping us bring these important conversations to life. And thanks, as always, to you, our global audience, for tuning in and engaging with us via Q&A and on social media. Please keep the conversation going using the hashtag FP Tech Forum. If you missed any part of today's program or want to rewatch, a recording of the event will be available shortly on our website, which is foreignpolicy.com slash events. Last but not least, I want to take this opportunity to thank our partners who have helped make our tech forum possible. And those partners are Microsoft, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs at Northwestern University, and the European Liberal Forum. There's much more to come from FP this fall. November 30 is the Independent Media and the Advancement of Democracy event. USAID Administrator Samantha Power joins us to discuss the vital role of a free press and public interest journalism in ensuring the futures of democracies worldwide. And on December 1 and 2 is FP's third annual Food Plus Summit. It returns with an exciting two-day program featuring top officials, experts, and leading innovators at the intersection of climate action and food security. We'll have conversations with policymakers, farmers, scientists, and celebrity chefs, so don't miss out on that program. And then finally, on December 8, is Great Power Plays in the South Caucasus. Against a backdrop of growing great power competition, shifting borders, and simmering tensions in the region, how can U.S. policy best support political and economic Economic engagement to shore up stability. You can find out more about those and other events and register at foreignpolicy.com slash events. And that is all for us today. I hope you enjoyed this event. I hope to see you again soon. And my name is Amelia Lester. I'm the executive editor of Foreign Policy. Take care. Until next time, goodbye.